Okay. So now in chapter number four, <clears throat> obviously we are going to get uh, 11 marks from it. So this is yeah. why it is quite uh, an important chapter. And this is one of the chapter uh, which also somehow decides whether we are passing or failing. I mean, this test design technique because 11 question comes and then the chapter number five from where you get nine questions. Okay, these two are the big, uh, big uh, chapters. If yes. we talk about test design technique, uh, then it we can divide it into two parts. One is the black box techniques and then the white box technique. And at the end, we have some experience based techniques. And when we talk about black box technique, uh, <clears throat> uh, in this we will uh, cover equivalence class and then boundary value analysis, decision, table testing, and then state transition testing. Okay, so these are the four topics which we are going to cover. And from all these four topics, we are going to get one application-based question. Okay. And then when we come to black box test, white box testing, in the white box testing, we cover statement coverage and decision coverage. Sometimes instead of decision coverage, you know, just to make you confused, they do decision testing. Now we should know the clear difference between these two. This is decision table testing. Okay. okay this is just decision testing. When they do, uh, when they when they play with it, right? They will give you one option and they will ask you that which of the following are white box testing or maybe black box testing. Normally they ask for black box testing. And one of the option, what they will do, no? they will give decision testing as an uh, uh, one of the option. So we consider decision testing and decision table testing is same as because of hurry or sometimes if we don't pay more attention, then we mark decision testing as our answer that this is a black box technique or we are confused. So be clear that this is decision table testing and this is decision testing. What is the difference anyway we are going to see in uh, future lectures? And but, also, Ajit, uh, this time I had got in white box testing, I, I get it that we have statement coverage, then we have uh, uh, decision coverage. There was also a question like branch coverage. Is it same as decision coverage? Yes. So decision coverage and branch coverage, both are same. Okay. Okay. Decision coverage and branch coverage. All right. Okay, so yes, so this is so decision testing, decision coverage, and branch coverage. All three, they all mean, I mean, the meaning of these three things are same only. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. And then once we come to experience based testing, then they have here that exploratory testing. And then we have error guessing. Okay. And um, I think let's see what others are there. I think two more are there in this. So this is uh, it. So this is all about black box testing means you just give some input and then you are expecting some output out of that. And you do not have any access to the code here. But when you go to the white box testing, then you can see the code or the flow chart or the internal functionality of your component. That is what you can see here. But here only what you can see is the behavior of the system. And this testing is can be applied on any of these two, like white box testing or black box testing. This is experience based testing. It is complementary to these techniques. So yeah, first, this user user based testing something. Yes, based on the experience of the user, yeah. how experienced the user is, or how mature your project is also. So suppose you had previous project and now you are working on a new project, a similar project. Then you can take a lot of data from here and apply it into this project also. Yeah. yeah. So experience, it could be experience of the people or experience uh, maturity of your product also. Both uh, will play here, the role. So now here we will not spend too much time in the theoretical part of it. Instead, we will directly jump to the uh, solving the questions over here. Okay. So I will just give you a brief here then again. So this black box testing is also referred as behavior based testing or specification based testing specification based testing so this is also the third name which we can also include here so 
in the exam if you get black box testing behavior based testing or specification based testing you should refer it to as a black box testing because okay. this testing is based on the requirement or the specifications and if you are working for agile project then the user stories okay yeah and then if you are working on the white box testing or structure based testing so again we have to remember both the names that white box testing or structure based testing so here we should know the information on how the software is constructed that means we should know the internal structure of your component and when we go to the experience based testing then it is uh, on the knowledge of the tester or developers or users based on their experience we try to write some test cases here so we should know the usage of the software how this software is going to be used or how this functionality we are going to use so likewise or about likely defects and their distribution so sometime when we are working on some features we know that okay these this is the area where we find lot of mistakes right or defects so you can focus on that area that that will come with experience only or the two or three times when you uh, work or when you test with uh, release 1 release 2 release 3 like that if you go on so maybe in the third release you have more experience at this time so that time you can also go for experience based testing yeah means normally we know okay which where normally the software fails which area we can just focus over there yeah so this is the overview of these three types so we will start with the black box technique so i already explained that the black box testing so we have this four plus another one use case testing this we will see so black box testing from here you are going to get application based question from here sometimes scenario based question or a direct question also you can expect from use case testing in your exam how it was did you get any scenario based question for use case testing or there was no yes, question yes i scenario. got a scenario based yeah okay i mean there was a, the very first question was uh, with respect to use case testing only <laughs> use case testing only and i couldn't answer that okay then let's see uh, if, okay if you remember your question also you can just let me know how it was and uh, anyway we are going to cover it okay so equivalence partitioning boundary value analysis state transition testing testing and decision table testing so normally these two techniques are we apply to the same thing okay this uh, means all together we can apply this technique okay and they are used to design the dynamic tests okay dynamic for dynamic uh, testing we can use these techniques okay when we go to equivalence partitioning what is the meaning of first of all where you can apply this equivalence partitioning you can apply this technique to the data which has some similarity in them then only you can divide them into some equivalence partition what i mean by that is uh, anyway we are going to see that example so here input or output values are divided in groups that are expected to exhibit the same behavior if you have a data a random data you cannot apply equivalence partition to that you can only apply equivalence partition to the data which exhibits same behavior so this is also one one, one of the important point which we need to know where we have to apply the equivalence partitioning so sometimes they give you some four options and then they will play with you and then one of the option will be the data which exhibits same behavior the data which exhibits different behavior likewise another two options would be there so the answer is that we can, or we can apply equivalence partitioning to any data like that they can form any question then the answer should be exhibit the same behavior if the data is not behaving in a same way then you cannot apply this technique not this one even boundary value also mm -hmm. so this is one important point here from the equivalence partitioning sometimes we also get theoretical question so that time we can focus over here and once you divide then the groups are referred as equivalence partition or a simple word classes you can use a word that equivalence partition or how many classes are there how many equivalence partition are there like that when you divide a equivalence partition while reading the question definitely you are going to get the valid partition i will also come to that what is the meaning of valid partition but then again we have to consider what is the invalid partition in that so this is this is like 
the direct thing which you will get. This you have to derive indirectly. When you are reading a question, this is an indirect requirement to you. That what will work, they will tell. Then you should understand that what will not work. Okay. Mm -hmm. So valid value means that will contain the valid. I means valid partition means it contains the valid values. Invalid partition means it will contain the invalid values. That means the the project or the software or the system will reject those values, and here the system will accept those values. If I have to give a very small example here, then we can say that there is a website, and this website will accept a positive single single digit integer. A positive single digit integer means it can expect accept a value from zero to nine only. So this will be our partition that zero and nine. So this will become valid. Whereas this field will not accept minus one and so on and ten and so on also over here. So this becomes our invalid partition. So though the question only shows one partition here that the valid data, but when we really put into Uh, a diagram here like this. This is equivalence partition diagram. So then we have to consider what is invalid in that. What the system does not contain because that is what is testing. Right. The, we have to check for the positive scenario as well as for the negative scenario. Negative. So this is how it is covered. So it now if someone asks how many partitions we have here or how many classes we have here, then we have three class mm -hmm. one, two, and three. Okay. Okay. So this is one part in it. So for an example, this is what is written here. Maybe I will directly go with this one. So suppose this is the table, and then they, uh, or maybe let's go with this one only. So here, if we see, uh, this is a grading system in an exam, and obviously in an exam, uh, if it, I mean, uh, normally in an exam, uh, we don't get uh, minus in negative, we don't get, and we don't get more than hundred. If that is how the definition is here, like. Between zero and hundred only you can get. Okay, this is the partition, and inside that also we can get different grades like grade D, grade C, grade B, grade A. When so zero to thirty, grade D; thirty to fifty, grade C; fifty to seventy, grade B; seventy to hundred, grade A. So if you remember, I was stressing on one point that uh, the equivalence partition should have same data, similar characteristics. Yeah. For an example, if I take eleven here. Or if I take twenty nine here, for both what we are representing, we are representing grade D only, right? Yes. So that's why we have some similarity here. That's why we are grouping them into one partition. So this is very important that how we group them. Okay. Okay. So this is how if you take any partition here, then uh, means any yeah any partition you will see that all the values within them will be <clears throat> representing the similar characteristics. and here also we have the valid partition from uh, 0 to 100 this is the valid data or valid partition inside valid partition also you can have sub valid partitions okay and oh. towards the end we also have the invalid partitions both hands okay yeah. so this is clear about it this is what they have shown here that if you have the data between 0 to 30 then any data you take from here to here they, that will be inside the grade d so that's why we have applied it on the same uh, values here okay so okay. so let's leave this now i will also cover boundary value and then we will solve question based on both boundary value as well as equivalence partition so for boundary value if you are not able to apply equivalence partition you cannot apply boundary value also there Mm -hmm. Okay, because equivalence partitioning you are applying on the similar data, so bound for defining the boundary also you should know until where the data is behaving similarly, right? For example, we had zero to thirty, thirty to fifty, fifty to seventy, seventy to hundred, and we told that this is D, maybe this is A, this is B, and this is C if we consider. So if you see here now, this is a invalid value. Then this is a valid value. and if you get one again you will get d here so you ensure that at this point at the boundaries things are right similarly if you come here you will see the difference that at 29 you get d grade whereas at 30 you may get c suppose and at 31 also you may get c here so again they are covering the complete boundary here so that's why if you 
means boundaries are applied when the similar data when the data is no more similar for example this place so here we have d and then we have c so that is why here we have a boundary okay okay and here also again when we are applying a boundary value analysis okay this one that time we should take a value one value from the invalid partition and one value from the valid partition what i mean by that is suppose you have this i gave you one requirement where we had like 0 to 9 the system will accept the value from 0 to 9 now if i apply a boundary here is it right 1 8 yeah, but is it right boundary value analysis no we also need the invalid okay so if we are going for two point boundary value analysis this is wrong actually because from here anyway it is going to accept these values we yes. don't we are not getting a sense or we are not getting a result for minus one we don't know that what will happen if minus one comes there is a possibility right the system may accept that also so this is not validated so our purpose is not solved for using this boundary value so that's why if we are applying zero and nine we must take minus one and 10. So this is a valid way of applying a boundary value analysis. Okay. Okay, because in the question, they will give this option and as well as this option. So sometime if this is the first option, suppose, and when we are in a hurry, then we will say, oh, these are the boundary. Let's, then we will mark this as a right answer. It happens in the exam. Okay, so that time we have to be very careful that we take one invalid value, we take another valid value then one valid value and invalid value. That is how we should apply. Here, this value was valid, this value was valid, this was valid, and this was valid. Both, all. And sometime in exam, they also trick by like zero and nine. So here they will give you minus one and here they will give you eight. So you see that, okay, this is at proper place. So maybe sometime we mark this one also as an answer. Okay, so they, many ways they try to trick. But then we have to see that at both the boundary, we should have invalid as well as valid. Okay. So this was the important point. We come to the next point. Mm, yeah, this is the point which I wanted to go. In the boundary value analysis also, we have two types. One is two point boundary value analysis. Another one is three point boundary value analysis. In exam, if it is not mentioned, which type of boundary values value analysis it is, then we should by default, we should go with two point boundary value analysis. Okay. Okay. So in exam, sometimes they give all the options and in one, you will see that two point boundary value analysis they apply properly and other one, three point boundary value is, is applied properly. But then your mm -hmm. answer should be two point boundary value analysis because the concept is that we should go for minimum number of test cases to validate a thing if means the with the, from the principle of testing we should not go for exhaustive testing yes so that is the reason we have to apply that but in the requirement if someone is saying specifically that you should go for three point boundary value analysis because we, i have also explained that it is context dependent so maybe the system is like that they want to go for three point boundary value analysis then we should go for it otherwise we should stick to two point boundary value analysis okay okay, okay. yeah so this is also one important point uh, here. And it's very simple to how to apply two point or three point. Maybe if I have a space here, maybe I will draw it here then. The same example I will take zero and nine. So if you have to apply a two point boundary value analysis, then you must go for minus one and 10. So until here, it will remain same. Three point means you have to take one value from here and a value from here. So this is your three point value. And it means this is invalid. This is valid, this is valid, but at the boundary only, this is valid, this is valid, this is invalid. So the difference is clear, right? Between two point and three point. If it is two point, then only you have to do this. Zero, nine, minus one, and 10. Okay. Okay, so this is how it is. So first you have to apply two point, then inside one more you have to take. So here it will be only invalid, valid, valid, invalid so this is how it goes okay so if this is clear then shall we solve some questions on it then okay okay mm. 
then I'm sharing my screen again. We will start with a very simple one. Maybe this one you can just try to solve. I think it's quite pretty easy. Valid classes you're asking. One of the fields on the form contains a text box which is comparing the parent parent class. Take the next class. Did you get the answer? Sorry. No, 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 one minute. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem. 17 is the answer for them. Yes, yeah, 17 is the answer. Since you got it, so we'll just go through it quickly. Yeah. So these were our options and we just wanted to invalid equivalence class, right? So now if you see here, the 19, 21 and 24, everything came in a valid. And then only 17 was in the invalid part. So that's why. This is the answer over here. Then let's take example number two. What it is about? Okay, maybe we can start. You can see this one also. Yeah. The difference that we should test one here itself. Okay. So twenty nine, thirty, and thirty one. These were the valid. Yeah, uh, twenty nine, thirty, and thirty one. Sorry, yes. So option C is the answer here, right? Okay, so likewise, let's move to next one. Yeah, this is also, sometimes they ask this question in different, different ways they ask, but yeah, this is also easy one only. Okay, one of the fields on a form contains a text box which accepts alphanumeric values identify the valid equivalence class, alphabets and number C. Okay, so is the answer here. Let's move yeah. to the next one. I think this one you might have solved. Uh, if not, let's see. Yeah, this is a little tricky one. <laughs> uh -huh. You have come across this question before? Yes. Okay. For uh, I think for this the answer is uh, a C or I did a mistake. Uh, for 4,000, we are going to add uh, 1,500, so 5,500, one class we'll get. And for 2,800, we have to again add Uh, sorry, I was speaking actually. Yeah. So here you said C, right? C is also answered if it is same equivalence partitioning, but here they have asked for different, different. equivalence. So even though you have solved the question, but you have marked wrong answer. So this is what I was talking about. So be careful. That's how they will trick you. So I will just solve here. Then 
what you did you also got the right answer only but all this data came in same equivalence class yes okay but the question was about different equivalence class so that is our answer d because 4000 is tax free 4200 is 10% and 5600 is 22% okay at least all the values are in different classes. So that's why if you compare all the options, then this is the correct one, means the right one here. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes we have to be a little careful also. Okay, let me just check this one is simple. Okay. Because now you know the things, then we will not go for the easy ones. I'm just opening some questions. Or maybe this one. This one I have also seen. If you know the concept, the current question, this one you can easily answer. Okay, which of the following is a valid collection of equivalence classes for the following problem? An integer field shall contain values from and including one. So one to fifteen will be one range, valid range. And mm -hmm less than that will be invalid and more than 15 is going to be invalid that is beyond 16 so b negative numbers 1 through 15 and above 15 you're asking for shall contain values is b the right answer no a is the right answer one minute one minute negative numbers less than one more than 15. That's right. Oh, yeah, right, right. Correct. No? Uh, yes, yes. Because the first one, no, it is very straightforward that you have here uh, one, suppose 15. So when okay. they say less than one, so it all automatically covers yeah. negative also. Then you have one, yeah. two, 15, and then you have more than 15. So that's why. This is clearly fitting, but if you go to B, why it is not right, I will just tell you that. That is important. So now you have 1, you have 15. Now they said negative numbers. So negative numbers will start with minus 1 and so on. What about 0? Yeah, it's, it's not at all that. covered. And because of this reason, B is not the answer. And if you go to here, again, same thing. No, this is less than 1. So here you are missing 15. Yes. So 15 is not covered. That's why this is not the answer. And here, if you go less than 0, 1 through 14, 15 and more. So 15, they are including. Not including. Yeah. Yeah. So 13 to 14. Okay. okay. So option A is the answer. But this is what I was saying. It is a very simple question and you just have to apply concept. But sometimes we may go wrong here also. Okay. It's always best to draw this diagram if you are into such type of questions, no? Because this will give you a clear picture. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's move to the next one. Yes, this one. Given for the specification, which of the following values for age or in the same equivalence partition. So if the age is less than 18, you are to end between 18 to 30, and you will receive 20% discount. Any not eligible greater than 30. So, Eighteen, twenty-nine, and 30. See? They are all falling in the same class, equivalence okay. partition. Correct. So maybe they, when they give 20 percentage all, then people get confused for what this 20 percentage is. So that is why uh, uh, is the tricky part here. But if we see the question, it is quite clear that 18 and 30 are the numbers here. And then if you get anything between this, then 20 percentage discount you are going to get. Yes. So that's why this 20 percentage is not on 18 per 18 or 30. It is just a number that said. And below to that is not insured. Above that is also not insured. So if you put this into the thing. Yeah, so C is the answer because then you have everything within it. So 
okay. Yeah. But you see here that this one is in the different classes. This is in the same class. They always give two options like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. This is their way of doing it. Now let's see this one. This one. If the temperature falls below 18 degrees, the heating is switched on. Okay. Below 18, it is switched on. When the temperature reaches 21 degrees, the heating is switched off. Equal. Set of input values to cover all the valid equivalence partitions. Okay. Did you get a question? What is use case testing? Use case, huh? Yes. Okay, maybe I will. Okay. 17, uh, 17, 18, 20, and 21 degrees. Okay. The temperature falls below 18 degrees, the heating. Let's solve it. I'm just not explaining because I think you have got the concept. So there is, is it A was your answer? No, I said B was my answer. Okay. If that is the case, then I will explain it now. B is the answer, but why did you go wrong here? What was the question? I actually didn't read the question. What is the minimum set of test input value to cover all valid equivalence partitions? Okay, all valid equivalence partitions. Okay. So all valid. Okay, I understood now. 15, mm -hmm. 19, 25, you're all in the valid range. Yeah, that is uh, one thing. And uh, the other point here is that uh, you want to cover equivalence partition, right? Uh, so in the equivalence partition, another concept is that we should take only one value from one partition. Okay. okay. So now when we have three partitions, then we should get only three values because we have three partitions. No, so in equivalence partition, the concept is that to check an equivalence partition, the minimum number of test cases, what you need is the number of partitions only. Okay, okay. so here you see that there are four values. This is also right, but the problem what is here is that this 18 and 20. So they both are in the same partition itself. Okay, yeah. so we should not take two value from one partition. Okay, so here yeah. if we see this option, so when we see the option, first you already got the partitions you got, right? Now you can directly directly remove option B and D. Mm. Because they here the, we have four values and here we have two values. So from the concept point of view, we have three partition, we should have only three values. Okay. Okay, so that way we can neglect this option. We can also neglect this option. Now we are left with this one and this one. Yeah. Correct. And here also we don't have anything from this partition and that's why the option A is answered. Means, uh, yeah, so this is how you can apply the concept also directly. Means from here onwards, when you see the equivalence partition, then if you are able to identify the partitions, then those many values should be here. The number of partitions is equal to number of test case you are using or number of values you are using in test case. Okay. Yeah. So this is the concept what we have. Yeah, this is also a good question. Yes. Okay. Okay, is going to provide their employment bonus which for the safety. So we send it. Okay. <clears throat> 
and two years only for five years. Four, four equivalence partitions. One, two, three, four. Okay, let's see. So, what is here? You already read the question, right? So, I will just draw the uh, diagram. This is the diagram you got, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it's uh, five here. Okay. The bonus calculation will be zero if they have been with the company for less than, okay. Yeah, the interface will not allow a negative value to be input, but it will allow a zero to be input. Yeah, actually in this question, no, there is some mistake over here. That's why I wanted to read. Actually, it is not five. I will tell you the reason for here, okay. This, uh, the answer is not D. Earlier it was D, but again with some analysis, the answer is C here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you may ask why this is the case. Because they shall, have... I, shall I tell like why did I say four? Uh -huh. uh, this is because uh, they have told zero if they have been with the company for less than two years. So that will be one class. And uh, second class will be uh, two to five years. And third class is going to be from uh, five year to 10 year. And beyond that will be the fourth class. So that's how I said it is four equivalence partitions. Okay. That is one more thing. Suppose you are starting with zero, even with you are starting with zero, because you cannot have zero to two, right? So this you have yeah. considered it as one class only, right? Yes. Completely. This is also one thing, but they have also clearly mentioned that this we should not consider here in the question itself. Oh, but favorite will be zero if they have been with the company for less than two years. Okay. So you just started directly with the two years. So less than two yes. years, it could be anything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is one, this will be two, this will be three, and this will be four. So that's why the five is not the answer. And uh, we should go with four equivalent partition. Okay. This is okay. fine. Let's do the next one. Easy one. This we are not done. Okay, let's do this. Yeah, maybe this one.
here they have given uh, the temperature between minus 10 to plus 40 degrees. So yeah. I am thinking, why do we have options of minus 11 degree? In option, they can give anything, right? You have to see that, uh, you have to draw that equivalence partitioning diagram and then you have to see that how it is. It is designed to work in this way, but if it is working in this way or not, who knows? So for that, you have to take values, right? Yeah, minus 11. Their idea was that they wanted to design that it was it should work only between minus 10 to 40 plus 40. But then we need to see also, right, whether it is operating below this uh, range or what. Okay. Or B, I, I, I think it's B because it's for all these values are falling in all the ranges of equivalence partitioning. Okay. So this is what they were telling that uh, we have the lower value as minus 10 and then we have 40. In that also they had some range that if it is less than 17, then the heating unit will turn on. So if it is less than 17, the heating unit will turn on until this point. And then okay. after that, maybe stop. I don't, I'm not sure, but this is what they have mentioned. And then you have 26, which is somewhere here, obviously after 17. And then they tell that if it is more than 26, then the refrigeration unit will turn on until 40 degree. Okay. Yeah. So this is how is their system. And now if we want to put the values there, like I will just put all the values. So here it looks like option A. Now, again, if you see, that's why I asked you to make this diagram. These two values are coming in same equivalence class. Okay. And because of that, this is not the answer. Though it all the values are valid, but here this minus 12 and 12. So between minus 10 and 17, you are taking two values. So it is not satisfying the equivalence partition uh, concept. Okay. Actually, uh, the table which I drew itself was incorrect. Okay. That's why I, I got answer B. Okay. Now okay. I understand. Yeah, so uh, I think now you got it right. Why it is like this? Because if we read the question, if we read the question, one they try to do two two things here. Okay, they started with something, but at the end they also gave you the hint that what is the minimum range, what is the maximum range. So that is what we have drawn here: the minimum range and the maximum range. But as okay. we mentioned that within minimum range and maximum range, also we can have sub valid partitions for that sub valid partition they have given these two range also so 17 and 26 again became your another range so here less than 17 heating was turning on and more than 26 heating was on here what is happening maybe off they have not mentioned but maybe because heating unit is not on and refrigeration unit is not on so maybe just a fan is running whatever it is but these are the four different partitions they have told okay two three four five so one, two, three, four. So you should have five values. Okay. So even okay. no need to draw. So once if you miss whatever equivalence partitioning you have drawn, even if you have drawn wrong or right, for an example, mm -hmm. if you draw wrong and right, you definitely get the numbers. One, two, three, four, five. In which option you have five things. So one, two, three, four. So this is not the answer. This is three, not the answer. This is six. So And this is the one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Was one of the purpose also to view this. Okay. What is this one? Mm -hmm. yeah. Then we will see another question. I think this one is also going to be simple one for you uh, from the current slide. Yeah. Okay, we have to find how many events partitions are needed to test the calibration of the bonus. Okay.
4 0 to 2 2 to 5 5 to 10 and then more than 10 Are you speaking on mute? Uh, yeah, yeah, you are right. So I, I was just telling that this is a simple question, but sometimes we get confused here with the numbers and also just see that how you proceed to this one. Okay, post it is for my It is 25 paisa. Is it paisa or what? Up to 10 grams. 25 page. Here it is written. Oh, P sorry. is for page. Yes, G is no, page and G is a gram. Okay. Uh, post to date for light like, letter. Okay. Uh, you want me to solve this one or you would like to try? No, I'm doing it. Okay. So what they are saying here is that um, just getting a pen for it, yeah. So what they're telling is postal rates for light letters are 25 pages. Okay, 25 pages up to 10 gram. So up to 10 gram means this is the partition means until here we are going to get 25 pages yeah. so this is what they're telling so uh, uh, this is 10 gram if it is uh, up to 25 pages we can get and up to 10 gram we will get this uh, partition then 50 uh, 35 pages up to 50 gram so you are at 10 gram 50 gram and till here it is 35 pages yeah for each additional 25 gram up to 100 gram now they are telling. So obviously you will get 75 in between and then you will get 100. Mm -hmm. Because they are telling each additional 25 gram. Okay, okay. Okay, so, so now you have until 100. Which test input would be selected using equivalence partitioning? So I just draw it here. B is the right answer then. B is the right answer. Your answer was A because I think you missed this. I one. missed that 75 grams, yes. Yes, it was because of that detailing which uh, you missed might be that additional, each additional 25 gram and then we will get into the 100 grams. Yeah. 
yeah so maybe these are the small means what i have now noticed is that these are there are some small small detailing i think where you might have got wrong in your exam also while solving these type of questions yes right yeah so maybe these questions also i will provide you maybe anyway it is the videos also maybe to practice okay so yeah this so this word was very important <laughs> here to right answer yeah okay no problem just got it maybe the last question from this topic uh, as of now yeah Best all the ranges we need for. We need four. That's how many English classes are necessary for all the ranges? Five. One, One to ten, then from. Yeah, but less than ten also we have to consider no one class. Yes. Because these are the valid classes completely that I understood that. But now what you missed is the invalid partition here. So from here to here it is fine. That's what they have given directly in the table. Okay, but then this is all valid. But where is the invalid? Because they have not told here, right? That. We should not consider the invalid one. This okay, part is so we have to consider the invalid one here if they have not mentioned it. Yes, if they have mentioned very specifically, then you have to just avoid it. Otherwise, you have to take complete. Okay. Because okay. they started with one, right? They started with one. But what about any other value, zero or minus one? Okay. okay. So that was a point here. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah. So now we can. This this is all the questions which we saw right now is from the equivalence partition. Now we will go with uh, boundary value analysis. Okay. Okay. I'm just closing all the questions first of all. So lots of things opened at my end. I'm just closing all of them. Okay, so now we go to boundary value analysis. This one is going to be simple only for you from the current side. Yeah, just try this one and give me a minute. Mm -hmm. Uh, you got the answer? Oh, oh, one minute, one minute. Okay, okay. So I was not here, so I just thinking that if you have said something.
Okay, uh, D is the answer for this. D is the answer, let's see. Mm. Yeah, so you see here, right, that <laughs> what they do. <laughs> so, yeah. Sometime when we are in hurry, then uh, maybe this would be our answer. So I have seen multiple times D is the answer for people, but here it's D, right? Okay, then we go to the next one. Uh, this one I think you can solve quite easily. You already have an idea, but earlier we had a question on this for boundary value uh, equivalence partitioning. Now we have a question on boundary value analysis. Okay, nearest whole point. Okay, to the nearest whole point which of this is okay. when uh, 10 years back i wrote my exam right that time i got this question they changed the number uh, but <laughs> it was in my exam, so that's why I remember it. B. The answer looks like to me over well, here a little bit changed actually. B became C. It, it, was it <clears throat> three three five zero one? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. I exactly got three three five hundred. We have. Hmm. Means B is the answer. That's right. B is the one. Because you got three three five zero zero nine. Right? This is exactly you yes. got. That's why three three five zero one is at the boundary, whereas rest of the yeah. values are somewhere in between. Yes. Okay. Okay. So this is how it is. Good to see a very good question. If it is there. This one. Maybe this one, something, something different than what we were doing till now. So maybe this one we can try. Okay, for this Three value, what you are saying. Transitions, okay. Three. I need so one, two, one, two, three, four. So like what then? Or you're solving. Um 
I think it is three. Uh, they are saying that we need uh, valid grade transitions. So we have to only count the number of valid uh, percentages here, no? No, no, no. Uh, we should not also read it like this. What they're telling here, how many test cases would be required? So they're telling how many test cases are required to cover the valid grade transition. So do it means uh, here this word valid, we should not go with the, the literal meaning of valid here. We want okay. to check the valid one, but how will you check the valid one without invalid points also there? Uh -huh. you want... In that case, it's coming as nine for me if I'm counting for. Hmm. And uh, the valid grade system is normally from CTs in percentage. So valid will be from zero to hundred only, right? Yeah. So, even, so all the values within this will be valid values only. Okay. So it is a valid grade transition. Zero to hundred we should consider it as a valid value. So whatever percentage you see here is, uh, what I see is a is a valid percentage only. Mm -hmm. So then in that case. Uh, zero to hundred zero will be one and hundred and then in that case the range whatever they have given it is three okay uh, still it is not right because they they have a boundary at this place only and when they say grade, valid grade that time as you consider right previously that in this itself some values could be negative so it, there uh, there are no values negative here Okay, these all things are invalid. What I mean here, maybe when I draw, it will be more clear to you. See, so what they're telling is we have the boundaries at 75, 85, and 95. Correct. Okay, now if I have to put a three point boundary value analysis, then each point I should have three values. Three values, correct. Like this, I should have. Okay, now yeah. none of these values are invalid. Yes. Because they are from zero to hundred. Within that only, these all these values came in. So that's why if you have to put three point boundary value analysis, then you need minimum these three test cases, these three and these three, all nine test cases. It means all nine values you need. That means nine test cases you need here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's clear, right? Or you have some doubts here? Or this no, no, it's clear for me now. Okay. Mm, yeah, maybe it's not a difficult one, but uh, yeah, so sometimes they just club uh, this equivalence class and boundary value analysis in one question itself. And that's why I thought it's good to solve one of these. Okay. Uh, what is the For only valid. Okay. See, or uh, so ten thousand, ten thousand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> here see is the answer. Yeah. See is the answer, and why it is the answer? Let's see that. Okay, so first of all, we have to apply boundary, and if we see all the mm -hmm. options, what we see here is that only option C and D are at the boundaries. Yeah. Right, but then we have three 
partitions here. So we should have three values for covering the equivalence partition also, right? So that's why you can we can directly remove this and this one is our answer. This covers the equivalence partition here. Yes? Yeah. Okay. So anyway, you got that one, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, this is the question I was looking for. And here is the question. Okay. So maybe you can take one or two minutes for this. Okay. To really understand and go through each of uh, words here that maybe you get some hints also, right? Okay. Each of his friends. Uh, are you still able to hear me, right? I mean, clearly. Yes, I can hear you. Fifteen uh, C or oh, sorry D. Fifteen. Okay. Here they are telling it. Okay. Each of the following value is least likely to have been identified for boundary value test design, okay. which is least here. So now if we see, so what they were telling here is that here that minus five degree and thirty degree. So this is the range. Okay. The range okay, minus 50, minus 5, and 30 is the operating range. In this, they are telling that we have a rainbow thermometer that where we have seven colors, and each color spans a range of five degrees. So you are at minus five if you take five degree, then until here you will have color one, then from zero to five, you will have color two, from five to ten, you can see a span of five only is there. Five. Yeah. Right, so we reach it. So all these things we have. Now, if you see these values, 30 comes here, 0 comes here, 8 comes here, 15 comes here. So which one is not in the boundary? Not in the boundary. Okay. 8 is not in the boundary. This is the least likely value which you are going to select. Okay. Okay. So that's why they have also stressed this word. Normally in exam also you get no like this some bold things where they stress. Mm -hmm. So that is why eight is the least likely values to have here. Okay. 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 For I missed to add zero and re remaining one, it was fine. But then 
Okay. At least I missed to read. Okay. Okay. If you apply both the analysis on the test basis, we will need to achieve minimum test. Eight A. Okay, let's check this one. Okay. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> now here, if we see, if we just apply these things, right? One to 49, then 49 to 59, 59 to 69, 69 to 79, 89, 100, right? Then if we are applying a boundary value analysis as they have not mentioned anything here, right? So for boundary value analysis, you need minimum two values, right? At each point. Yes. So here you need two values, then again, two, four, six, eight. Okay. So that's why you have seven boundary point means you should have seven into two. The minimum number of test cases. Any doubt here? No, actually, I'm making a lot of mistake in drawing the table itself. That's where I'm going wrong. But why it was the where did you go wrong here in this table? Uh, in this table, from zero to forty-nine, I considered that as one class. Then next after that, fifty to fifty-nine, I considered that one range. I did not uh, take uh, separately like this. I mean, one to forty-nine is fail, right? Yes, yes, one minute. Let me just draw how you did it. I just want to see uh, and then let's see if I can give you some explanation. So how was your table? Your table was from zero to? Uh, it is, uh, first table is from zero. Yeah. Uh, and then second range is ranging from one to 49. Oh, again, one to 49 you took. No, one and 49 will be in the same class. Okay. In that same range. Okay. Let me and then uh -huh. uh, 50 to 59, that is uh, in the same range. Okay, 50 to 59 also you have considered in the same range, okay. Then 60 to 69, so whatever they have described, I have uh, put everything. Uh, okay, actually we should not go uh, like that. No, I will tell you that how we should go here. Maybe uh, I will just also try to explain that how we should draw this equivalence class. So how we yeah. need to draw is that, see here they have mentioned based on the score achieved, the grades are as follows. So grade are, grades are as follows means they're telling from one to 49, we have F. So normally you will have this as a grade, complete grade, like one to 100, you know that 
these are the valid grades great yeah now in between they are telling that from 1 to 49 it is f so maybe we can consider 1 to 49 as it is here mm -hmm. i will tell you there are two ways okay one is here already 1 to 49 you considered now we already know that from 1 to 15 it is the same values right yeah so this is the next value which is going to be 50 then this is a different value so we don't need to mention 50 again here okay okay you can directly take 59 what i mean here is that you can directly take this value the last values okay fine these last values you have to consider and first values you can leave the other way is that you can also do it like this you can say that okay from 1 to 50 i will take I I want that one to forty nine is the same value, right? That's why I'm starting from fifty. Yeah. Then if you start from fifty, then from fifty to you have to take sixty now. Yeah. Okay. Either you can take the last values or you can take the first values. Okay. Okay. You cannot mix both. So now if I take sixty, then I will take next one as seventy. Then I take. Eighty, and then eighty. No, eighty after eighty, ninety. Yes, I have to take ninety. Okay, so this is how your graph will be. So this is also a right graph. This is also a right one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Again, you get seven points only here. But when you have to apply equivalence partitioning, now how the equivalence partitioning will be here? Like in, I have not drawn the equivalence partitioning here. So the equivalence partitioning could be like here. Why here it will be like zero, then one. This is these are two values. Okay, then you have here forty uh, nine until you, you cannot take forty eight now, right? Forty eight and forty nine comes in the same range. Yes. So this could not be a equivalence partitioning. You have to take this as your equivalence partitioning fifty. Okay. Okay. Then you cannot take fifty eight because fifty eight and fifty nine are the same. So you have to take sixty here. Okay. Then you are at sixty nine. Then you have to take this one as seventy. This one as eighty. And if you see all of these things, everything is coming on your right hand side. All the values. Yeah. And here, if you go, you have to take one um, zero one. Okay. Okay. This is clear. Now, if I have to apply a boundary value analysis for this one, it's going to be different. You have zero here. This is one. This is still same. Now you cannot take fifty one because fifty and fifty one are same. Now you have to take forty nine. Here you have to take fifty nine. Here you have to take sixty nine. Here you have to take seventy. Nine, and here you have to take eighty. Nine, but here again you have to come. You have to take hundred and one only. So if you see in this diagram, every all the boundaries are on your left hand side, and here the boundaries yeah. are on right hand side. So it does not matter actually that how you take the values, but you cannot consider like uh, uh, like you take forty nine and again you take fifty. You cannot do that. The above one, uh, it is ninety nine, right? After ninety. No, 89. because ninety nine. If you take ninety nine here, so ninety nine and hundred are same values, no? Yes. Okay. So again, you cannot take ninety nine here because you always need an invalid and a valid means different two different units. Okay. Okay. Now you got how we have to draw the equivalent in this diagram from this table. Yeah. Okay, and uh, both of these diagrams are same, but answer is going to be fourteen only because again two, 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 so seven into two only, so it's fourteen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this is how we need to proceed for sir such questions. I think I had got this question, and this is where I went wrong. Ah. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Or maybe very similar to this, you might have got. Yeah. Or the same question. Don't remember the numbers, but the pattern was same. Yeah, pattern. That's why I mean here they have tried to make the same pattern in the same way. Uh, this one also you can try by yourself without seeing this one. Just you can make a diagram from this one also, and then maybe compare it. Yeah. Okay. Okay.
so then i am quite uh, it looks quite promising that you got got similar type of questions and the doubts are also getting cleared here so yeah. next attempt it would be much better than this one let me try this one now i think this should be okay only Testing for start put using founder value in this okay. Uh, C is answer, four, five, and then. What is the answer? First of all, did you get this right? Uh, five, yes, that is right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. This is the answer, okay. <clears throat> Since you said uh, you got uh, in some of the questions wrong, right? One more question like that, like this. Maybe you can try this one. Then.
D fifty, fifty-five, and sixty. Here only the value of the boundaries of the equivalence class are selected. Uh, which would be the most likely set of values identified by applying the boundary value analysis when only the values on the boundaries of the equivalence class are selected. Okay, it's actually a boundary value analysis question. But why are you saying only B? Oh, one minute, one minute. 0 to 0 49 and 54. 54 and 54 and 54. But why are you considering zero as one of your value? Because it is anyway, it should start from 50, right? 50 or less. So less could be anything. So 50 or less, that's from where we should start. 50 or less. So it will include also 49. Yeah. First, let's draw the, uh, the, the points. Okay. Then we should go for the boundary. So I will not directly make a... Uh, directly draw it now. I will draw it for you by reading the statements only. Okay. So okay. here we are telling if you drive 50 kilometer per hour or less, nothing will happen. So what they are actually telling here is that suppose this is the line. If you draw and they say 50. So before 50, nothing is happening. That's how it is. That's it. Okay. This is the first point. With first line, we got this one. Now let's go to the second one. If you drive faster than 50 km per hour, hour, but no more than 55 km per hour, you will be warned. So let's take another as 55, but not more than 55. So let's consider 55, not a problem. 55. Then and other interval is going to be 60. Mm -hmm. So next would be 60, where you will be fine. And, and greater than 60 will be one more. Then this is suspended. That's it. So you have only three points here. Okay. Okay. Now you have to apply the boundary. So now see, now how you can apply the boundary. Now, uh, while applying the boundary, what you need to consider is that suppose you take 51. Mm. So at 50, what it is? So if you drive 50 kilometer or less, then 50 kilometer or less is nothing. 50 is also nothing and less than 50 is also nothing, mm -hmm. right? If you drive 50 kilometer per hour or less to so 50 kilometer, also if you drive, nothing will happen. If you drive faster than 50 kilometer per hour, then only is the problem, you will be warned. So that's why if you take 49 as one more value here, for an example, 49 also nothing is happening, 50 also nothing is happening, but then you're not checking this boundary clear completely, right? Yeah. Instead of 49, you should take 51. Because now if you at 50, nothing is happening. At 51, you will be warned. So this is what is the boundary. Okay. Okay. Now, if you come here, 55, if you take 54, what will happen? You will be warned. Be warned. Yeah. 55 also, you will be warned. Both warned, warned. Then this is not a boundary. That means 56. you have to take 56. At 56, you are not warned. You are, you will be fined here. So that's why we should consider these two as a boundary and not these two as a boundary. Okay. Okay. And then similarly, 60 and 61. So that's why the answer should D. be option D. Okay. Okay. Got it. Hmm. Now you are getting the point here, right? How we should proceed uh, with this yes. thing. Okay, so option D is the answer over here. And uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is the thing. Yeah, let me just do the next one. Okay. This is also not nothing much to solve here, but yeah, I have means here again you have to apply the concept. So just try this diagram and then see that where these things are getting fit.
Jordi. Mm -hmm. Let's check that. So first of all, did you get this right? Yes. Okay. So your answer was D. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So again, um, why did we go with ten and hundred? I mean, the uh, the only difference between B and D is that we have ten and hundred. So with ten and hundred means uh, what was in your thought that we you have selected this no and not this one. It was in the valid range, that's why I selected that. But it is not at the boundary, right? If you get the, because they are only talking about the boundary value analysis. And now if we, so here is one and here is 10. So it is no way near to the boundary. If you get this diagram, this one, then it is clear that you need one value here maybe and one value maybe here. So you need a you need only four values because if you have two boundaries, then the minimum number of test cases will be four only. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. So yeah, if yeah. it is four, then if you count here, one, two, three, four, five, wrong. One, two, three, four could be. One, two, three, four, five, wrong. Again, here more than wrong means even without going further solving, this is the answer because if you have two points at the boundaries, then you cannot have more than four values. Okay. okay. So yeah, so this we should not have considered. Anyway, so this is one thing. But whatever questions we have covered, no, as of, until now, I think you are not going to get anything different from it. Something within it only you are going to get. Maybe go through this. Uh, I will practice them more. Yes, yes, yes. That, that's what I meant. That you just practice them more, more. and not necessarily how I got the the boundaries, right? Uh, I yeah. uh, in one of the example I have shown you also that it is not necessary that you are also going to get the same boundaries. You can get a different boundary also. So maybe try that okay this is in the exam this is in the video let's uh, let's try the other way how can i draw these boundaries okay so that way you can challenge here there is uh, so this is all about equivalence class and boundary value analysis which i wanted to to cover okay and then uh, comes the next topic but we will take a break of some time 15 minutes yeah okay so 11 38 shall we join by 12 only then then 12 to 1 we will cover another concept okay 12 o'clock fine yeah okay then we'll join at 12 then yeah thanks
Hi, Kiran, are you in? Yes, I'm coming. Okay, you answer. Okay. So, I think now then we can move to the next topic from here on, right? Okay. Okay. So now the next topic is uh, related to state transition testing. Again, we, are, we have to solve some questions here. So a straight transition testing is also a type of black box test design technique in which test cases are designed to execute both again, valid and invalid states. Okay, so again, we have to consider both valid and invalid. So any technique we take, we our objective is to cover both part, valid and invalid. Otherwise, we don't know what is invalid in the system. Maybe the system may take the invalid part also, right? So that's why that needs to be considered. And uh, this is theory. With this, you will not get much thing, but I will explain you the state transition testing with the help of this diagram. So in a straight transition testing, we have basically three components, I would say. First one is a state, okay? And now, and like here we have two states, state one and state two. If you want to go from state one to state two, we need a transition, okay? So this arrow <coughs> so shows that the transition is from S1 to S2 and not from S2 to S1. Okay, so the, with yeah. this arrow and this transition means when you, you can go from state one to state two, that will, there will be some event. Just for an example, what we mean here is, for example, you have a website and then there is a, there are two pages, page one and page two. So now you can do a transition from page one to page two, when you get an event of this button pressed or when once someone clicks here. Right. Yeah. So this click will be your event. So you have both the states in your system, but you cannot go from one state to other state until you have an event in between. So once you click, that is an event. And then we can go from one state to the other state. And that is what they are mentioning here. So here we have states. So from one state, we can go to the other state with the help of our this transition diagram. We will know from which state to which state we can go. And then an event should occur uh, so that this transaction will take place. This is not required to uh, for us to read here right now, but we will directly go with this diagram. Okay. Did you get any question based on these diagrams like this or from state transition? No, testing? probably this time I will get. I did not hmm. get last time. Or something like this table? No. No. Okay. Then you can expect a question from state transition testing then. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's try to understand this diagram. This is actually a lot of states here. In exam, maybe this one or maybe simpler one you may get. Okay. So now uh, here, if you see, first you have to always identify how many states you have. Okay. So now here we have one, two, three, and four. We have in total four states. And we also have to know that from which state we can go to which other state, like from this state, you cannot directly go to this state, right? So that direct transitions first we will see. So for an example, if I take S1, S1, from S1, where and all I can go from just from S1? S3 and S2. Right, S3 using this one and S2 using this one. Yeah. Suppose I want to go to S2 first, S2. I want a transition from S1 to S2. Then event is change mode. You understood this one? Yeah. So this is how we have to read. If you get this table, then how you have to read is that you are going from S1 to S2 with the help of this transition CM. If the transition CM occurs or the event CM occurs, that is change mode. Similarly, you can go from S1 to S3. When you have a transition, R. S1 to S3 is reset. Reset. That is R here. So this you understood, right? From S1, we have two transitions. This yeah. is clear. Similarly, now suppose I want from S2. Okay. So from S2, where and all we can go? From S2, we can go back to S1 or using change mode. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, sorry. Using display time. 
and uh, to S4 also uh, using a reset. We can go to S1 and from S2 we can also go to S4. And here with the help of date time and then here with the help of a reset. Here they have given uh, two events that is uh, reset divide by alter date. Mm -hmm. This two or same event or we have to consider the uh, how we are, how the flow goes. No, this is actually is the event, complete event. So it could be like, event. I don't know what is change mode. It could be like suppose 100, then display time is 10, then answer will be 10. Okay. Complete okay, okay. event here. But it does not matter as long as we know that, okay, this is how is the transition going on. Okay. Hmm. Mm -hmm. so, and from S3, we can have only one transition. So if we want to go from S3 to S1, then we can have this TS. Yeah. As the transition. Similarly, if you go from S4, you can go to S2 with the help of DS maybe. Yes. Okay, this, and this is what is represented here. Okay. So from S1, we, we could have gone to two states, from S2 also two, and from S1 only one, and from S4 also one, right? That is what we have seen. So totally six transitions we had. Okay. Yes. Now, that was a state diagram and this is a state matrix or state table state table has one restriction that is that it is limited to the valid transitions only very important term from the exam point of view also that the state table is limited to valid transitions only it does not cover the invalid transition okay yeah and this is like two states this is not uh, related to istq foundation level this is required when you go for the advanced level okay in the foundation level this is not needed but what it is i will just tell you for example from s1 with two transitions you can reach s4 right how you can yes. like from um, s yeah. S1 to S3, then S3 to S4, or S1 to S2, then S2 to S4. S3 to S4, you cannot go. Uh, yes, we cannot go. There is, it's an invalid trend. Correct. So only from S1 to S2, S2 to S4, you can go. From S1 to S2, that is CM. And from S2 to S4, it is R, reset. Yeah. Okay, so this is what is one transition. Similarly, from S1 to S1 also you can come from S1, S CM, S2, S2, CM, S1. This way, similarly from S1, you can also have these transitions. So from S1, you can have three transitions. Yeah. And if you see here, S1, you have three transitions. Similarly, from S2 also, you will have three transitions, right? Then from S3, you have two and from S4 also, you have two. But Two transitions are not there for foundation level. It is there in the advanced level syllabus. I mean, I okay. also provide training for the advanced level, right? So there we solve such, such type of questions where we have two transitions. This is uh, not required. Yeah, this is so until here we stop before we start decision table testing. Now let's solve some of the questions based on state transition testing. Suppose this is the question.
or A is invalid? A is invalid, right? I think yeah, that's the all that is also the answer because from from, from basket to check out, uh, check out to basket we have. No, it is a valid one. Also, no? Check out to basket is right only. No? Check out to basket you can have, then basket to check out also you can have. Yeah. Okay, uh, C is a uh, C is incorrect. No, C is incorrect because here because of this one basket. Yeah, to log out. Basket so, yeah, so here if you see C option, so from login to browser you have, from browse to basket you have, from basket to checkout you have, but from checkout to basket also you have, but from basket to logout, this transition we don't have, this big transition, so yeah. there are multiple small transitions, this is a wrong transition here, but if likewise if we ch check for all others, we will find that all the transitions are there. Okay, so this yeah. was one of the simple question here. Let's open the next one. Then. Also not that. C is the right answer. C? A to B. Yeah. Okay. This is two is one. Then mm -hmm. so here that's what they're telling from so the, based on this we have to now um, take action. So from S S S1, if you want to go, so you take this part. That's why you mm -hmm. cover A. So you got A here. Maybe I take a better pen that is visible properly. Yeah, so this is what you got from S1 to S2. When you go from S1 to S2, then you get B. So that's why you have B in number. From S1 to S2, from S1 to S2 over. So from S2 to S1 again, that is, this is the part you're taking. So it is E. Then from S1 to S2 again. So that's why you will have again B. Then from S2 to ES. Then you have F, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. So A, B, you have yes. to be careful. Here. The answer is A here. Okay. So it's directly from S2 to S2. E. That's why you have to take this yeah. path and not this path. Because this is not a valid transition. Suppose this is not there, means you cannot directly reach here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So here it's F. Okay. Next one. That's for the advanced level. Let's see a simple one again. No. Checking this out. Usually, this is the type of question we get. I'm just checking that if something relevant is here. Yeah, this is one relevant question. Yeah, this one. Yes.
B. Uh, so like here, C is the answer. Zero is zero. S one S one S one S one two S four S four two S one. This transition is covered. S one two S two then S three. So all the transitions are covered here. Let's try with the others. Yeah, then S0, the first one we are trying, S0 to S1, S1 to S2, S2 to S4, S4 to S1, and S1 to S4. We missed this transition. Yeah. Okay. So next one, S0 to S1. So this is S0 to S1. S1 to S2, S2 to S3, S3 to S1, S1 to S2. The two transition we missed, this one and this one. Okay, so this is how we have to do this question. And now if we see the last one, this is from S0 to S1, S1 to S2, S2 to S3, S3 to S4. There is no transition from S3 to S4. So here it's also wrong. So that's why it's option C is the answer. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So let me just try something else. If you have something, no. okay, we have these many questions, and apart from this, uh, <clears throat> in uh, there are uh, I have given you one document, right? In that document, also, there are some questions towards the end that you can try and if you do not get that then uh, you can have a look into it okay maybe last question which i have this one also we can try if your anyways answer is mark was just try to get how we get this answer Yeah, but, uh, B is correct because from resigned to retired, we do not have a, a transition. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to check the invalid one only right here. Yeah. So that is how these type of questions are done. Now, usually these are easy questions only, but uh, we have some questions based on straight transition. It is there in the question paper. You try that. And if you do not get it, then uh, anyways, in the next session, we will check that. Now, when we move to the decision table testing, so. Uh, here, first of all, we need to see like how we need to look into a decision table. So normally a decision table will have these four parts. This is one part, this is second, third, and four parts. A decision table will have this. In uh, yeah, and one more thing, the question, sometimes if you get a theoretical question, they ask one line that in which of the uh, design technique, uh, we use input and output values. So input and output values or input and uh, based on input combination, we select the output that is in the decision table. Okay. Like we select the, we select the means if you read a scenario and after the scenario, you come to a conclusion that, okay, here we have, we are dealing with some combinations in the input, right? That time you should select decision table as your answer that we should apply decision table testing there. Okay if there is a combination in the input. And that is what is here that 
you will have certain type of combination you will see the example also this is just an overview you will have some um combinations here for the input and then again you will have some combinations for the output these are called conditions these are called actions okay then whatever conditions you have now you can make some probabilities here that which will occur when based on that we will decide some rule that okay suppose this is condition 1 condition 2 condition 3 if condition 1 happens these things will happen in action if condition 1 and 2 happens then this will happen in the action if condition 3 happens this will happen if all the three condition happens then this then this something something in the action will happen so based on the combination here we select the action something in the action what i mean by here is for example in the traffic light we will have Uh, these combinations, okay, like red, amber, or green. These three combinations we can have, and then we can have the possible combinations of these lights. Like only the red light is glowing, or maybe the red light was glowing and then the amber light is glowing after that, or only the green light is glowing, or only the amber light is glowing. There is also a possibility that none of the lights are glowing, or the possibility that some all the lights are glowing. Or amber or green is glowing, or red and green is glowing. But these are all the combinations. Obviously, we have three things here. Then we can get seven combinations, right? Eight combinations. Yeah, eight combinations like zero 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 one zero one one like that. So now what they say is based on these combinations, there could be these possible outcomes. These are the possible actions. For an example. if you have if only the red light is glowing then the person has to slow down they have to prepare to uh, stop and then finally they should stop okay this is clear yeah. then then if the red light is glowing and after that the amber light goes that means we need to prepare to go if the red light if the, sorry if the green light is glowing then we should leave the place then go if only the amber light is glowing then we have to slow down and we have to prepare for to stop if none of the lights are glowing then we should again prepare to stop stop and then mark it as halt we should report a fault here because we cannot take any decision no if none of the lights are glowing similarly but you don't have to go into logics of it just try to understand that based on the combinations we may get different different action that is what we need to get at the end from here similarly if all the lights are glowing then you cannot take any decision so you have to stop and then you have to report the fault if you have amber light glowing and green light glowing together then also you cannot take any decision and then you will finally report a fault if the red light is glowing and the green light is glowing this is also not a correct combination so that's why again the same thing will happen now if you consider here only for these combinations some different actions are happening but for all of these actions all of these combinations the same actions right action is same here that is why we can say that for these combination these are the output and for these or all, all other combination is this one only else okay uh, just give okay. me a two minute i am just getting an important call i'll join back yeah sorry for yeah Oh yeah, I am back. Uh, just some important call was there. Okay. Now we need to see some questions based on this decision table, right? So what is there next? Yeah. Just give me a minute. For decision table, do we have something? Okay, so <clears throat> yes, I do have one question here. Let's 
but let's see. I wanted to ask some simple question first before this. <clears throat> Suppose this is the question. These are the options. I just wanted to go through the question so that you are aware of the question and then I will start explaining it. Okay, I have read the question. I have understood it. Okay. So now, uh, whenever you have this decision table type of question, so always again you have to focus on the decisions. Okay. So mm -hmm. I have not chosen a correct one. So now, how to read this table is that you have condition one, you have condition two, and condition three. What is condition one? That employment for more than one year. If you are employed for more than one year, and in the question they say that you will get bonus only if your employment is more than one year, and then you agree to the target and you have achieved it. If all three yeah. conditions satisfies, then only you will get the bonus. Otherwise, you are not going to get bonus. And that is what is mentioned here that whether your employment is more than one year or you agree to the target and whether you have achieved the target or not. And based on that, the action is that you are going to get bonus. Now, when we read here rules, so yes means we have completed one year. Oh, yeah. And then no means here we have not agreed to the target and we have not achieved the target. So obviously we are not going to get the bonus also. Hmm. Yeah. We have not completed one year so and we have not achieved the target. Nothing, all no, so no is the bonus also we are not going to get. Here we have completed one year. We have also uh, agreed to the target, but we could not achieve the target. So no bonus. Now here again, we have completed more than one year. Then we agreed to the target. So if we didn't complete one year, we agreed to the target and we have not achieved it. So we are not going any, we are not getting anything here. Here we have completed one year. We didn't agree to the target, but we achieved the target. This is not a real time scenario, right? That this is how yeah. it happened. So this is the one thing. Then the next one is that we have complete we have not completed one year again this so it, is not, yeah, it is again does not make sense here again condition yes we have completed one year everything is yes so yes this is the correct answer and then last one that we have not agreed to the condition but uh, means we didn't come we didn't complete one year but we agreed to the target and achieved the target so still we will not get the bonus because we didn't complete one year yeah now what they're telling is which test, test case could be elimin eliminated in the above decision table because the test case would not occur in the real situation. Okay, so let's see T1 and T2 first. So T1 says that uh, you have completed one year. Okay, and uh, you have not agreed to the target. This, so this is right. So this one can occur in the real time scenario, right? And even T2 that you have, you have not completed one year. So you didn't agree to the target and you have not achieved the target. So these two looks okay. Okay. Now let's see T3 and T4. So T3 says that you have completed one year. You agreed to the target. You didn't achieve the target. And that's why you are not getting the bonus payment. So this is fine. This also can occur. Even uh, sub, sometime uh, this T3 and T4, right? T4. So you have not completed one year, 
but you agreed to the target and you have not achieved it so you didn't get it. this also looks okay to me that even if you have not completed one year but still the target they can decide right and even only thing is we will not get the bonus so looks okay to me as of now let's see option 7 and 8 oh, yeah this is a very valid situation actually and this is also a valid situation right that you here everything is yes means you will get the bonus here you have not agreed to the target but you have like uh, you have agreed to the target you have achieved the target but you didn't get the bonus so this is also right now if you see t5 and t6 only left with these two only so that's why you know, so what i do in the exam is normally i start from the down one only most of the time c and d are the answer because uh, here you will spend time and here will be the answer actually especially this type of question so t5 and t6 if you see you know that we already discussed right it is not possible that you are not agreeing to the target when you don't know what is your target how can you say that you have achieved it correct yeah so that's why these two are the least likely thing which can happen in a real time scenario that you are not agreeing to the target there is no target itself but you are saying that you have achieved the target so this is not making uh, a sense over here right so that's why d is the answer any doubts you have while solving this type of questions uh, no no this is how it is uh, we will see that can we solve one more question based on that at least because here questions are going to be of this similar nature only how you see it here right now uh, normally they do not give a very complicated one so here also they have given some loan scenario and based on that some questions are here okay so you can also try these questions something like this we have already covered in our session itself yeah good that we have we got one question based on a decision table so this is on decision table is it clear enough is it visible to you yeah yeah it's visible uh, let's increase it size oh there it went Somehow I highlighted it, but please try to manage. I don't know how to remove this uh, highlights now. Yeah, now you have it here. here we are we are having two actions yes okay we have two conditions and two actions
So we have to read this question uh, like the order type. If the condition is order type as wholesaler, then he is eligible for free delivery. That will be yes. Is mm -hmm. that how we have uh, yes, for this yes. question? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And he will also get 8% discount. Is B the right answer? Okay, let's check this one then. <clears throat> so since you have already read the question, so I will just go with the, the question over here. Hmm. Okay. Anyways, so who will order two one zero zero? So where is two one zero zero? It's here, right? Rule three. Over thousand. This is wholesaler. So this is the wholesaler one. So this one first. Right. So then it should get a yes and eight percent discount. So free delivery and eight percent discount. Yes. So here you can see that here all the options have that. So, so out of B C D one answer we are going to get. And then retail order 750. So 750 will come here. No and 2%. So no and 2%. It is going to be the answer here. So this is how we have to solve the decision table related questions. Okay. Usually the question will be like this only. You just have to read. In the, the question will be there. No, here only the here only you have to read and then you have to match with your table. Okay. okay nothing uh, more than that we do here. Okay. And for use case testing, we will see that if I get some scenario, I think right now I don't have with me. Okay. But then we will see that if I get in scenario, then I will uh, cover that. Okay, fine. Okay, one minute before going here, I just shared one question in the WhatsApp. Did you check that? Was that the question or the question was different for use case testing for you? Uh, I didn't check one. Let me check. Mm -hmm. That was one of the questions which was asked in exam. Recently, someone has sent that to me. Yes, yes, this was the question. This was the question. Okay. Okay. So it looks like nowadays this question is in trend. So I have a lot of such questions. I will also share with you. Okay. <clears throat> so you try to find this answer again, maybe with uh, the ISTQB syllabus itself. And I will also give you the answer. I had chosen three as option. I don't know if it was right or not. Use case testing. How is it this guy took a snapshot? We were not allowed to take. I'm not sure now. <laughs> I have not asked him. <laughs> I do cross check with him. Okay. But he has uh, almost all the questions with him. So, okay, fine. Or he got it from somewhere. I don't know. Anyways. So, At the center where I went, he was very strict. He uh, didn't allow me to any phones. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, there is another concept here uh, for calculating the percentage. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how you calculate the percentage, I will just give you an example here now that suppose I, I gave an example before, right? That zero to nine, we have the transition. Suppose equivalence partition, we have to apply. Then how many values we need minimum? Total values we need for test. Uh, Three. Sorry? Three. Three. So that uh -huh. is the total number of values. Okay. So three will come down. And suppose I chosen only eight. 
that means out of three values which we should have taken, I have taken only one value. So it will become one divided by three into hundred to calculate the percentage. Means this is the total number of test cases or total number of values which you should have selected. And this is the number of values you have actually selected. Mm -hmm. Is it clear what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if I take uh, some more examples like this, so here, mm -hmm. how many values we need? Total number of values. Four. One, two, three. One, two, yeah. three, four. Simple. So if this four here. So now I'm not writing anything. Suppose I chosen one value from here and one value from here. That means how many out of four I have covered? Two. Two. That is two divided by four into hundred, and obviously it is fifty percentage if you calculate. Because four yeah. out of two you have done. So this is how the calculation will be done for equivalence partitioning. So there is a chance that they will give you, tell you that this is the equivalence class. And in this equivalence class, only these values are covered. Then you have to go in the equivalence class and see that how many equivalence classes are covered. If all the equivalences are, classes are covered, that means 100% coverage. Okay. Hello. Uh, I have internet connection issue. Okay, okay, no problem. Uh, your voice is a little breaking for me. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now I can hear you well. Yes. So I was just saying that suppose in the exam, no, in exam what they will do is they will give you a question which will which with which you can draw the boundary value analysis, and they will also tell you that with these values we have tested it, how much percentage we have achieved. So these values you have to put in your diagram and see that where and all it fits. If it fits in all the places, then it will be hundred percent coverage. Okay. I mean, suppose I have drawn this diagram and they tell that the, we have, we have written a test case by considering eight as a value. So if you put in this diagram, eight will come here. That means this equivalence class is covered. We should have covered three, but we have covered only one. So two are left out. So it is one divided by three. Yeah. yeah. And then I have erased that. Now, if you go for the boundary value analysis, right? So for boundary value analysis also, I will take the same example. So zero and nine, suppose. Okay. Then how many values we can cover cover here? Means for boundary value analysis, how many values we need in total? In total, three values. Four, right for boundary value four because at each point we need One, two values. Two. Oh, correct. Okay, so always if we have two boundaries, then it is four. So we you need four four things. But suppose you have taken only one at this point, you have taken minus one support. In, then you have covered one, two, three out of it. So three divided by four into hundred you have to do. Okay. Is this concept getting clear to you? Yes. Okay. Yes. Similarly, two in boundaries in the system, four. Okay, fine. This two is there and one nine is also covered here. No, so that's why one two three. Mm -hmm. And for decision table also, it is uh, simple. So normally in decision table, if you see here, then you need these many test cases. That is eight test cases you need. And in the test case, if sorry. No, nothing. Okay. This is one test case. This is second one. Likewise, you have eight test cases here. So in this, yeah. normally it will be written like you have seen you know, T1, T2, T3. So they may say yeah. that we have covered T1 and T2. So okay. out of eight, you have covered only two. So that will be two divided by eight into hundred. Okay. That's how it is. Okay. Same yeah. goes with the state transition okay. testing. So they may ask you that you have six states right now. Yeah, here, if you see from this, you already know that there are six states, direct states. Then they will tell that out of that, we have covered third and fourth state. So that means two divided by two hundred. That's it. Okay. Okay. So this is what is the state transition. This is how you calculate the percentage. So the formula of percentage is, is not only equivalence partition for anything. It is the number of covered partition or number of transitions covered, number of boundary values covered divided by total number of things what you have into hundred. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
in the uh, i have never seen a question on this uh, in the in the advanced in the foundation level levels in advanced level do they do ask but in the foundation level i have not seen but it's it is there in the foundation level syllabus itself okay so they may ask uh, in the exam also now going to the two more things that is statement testing and decision testing okay i mm -hmm. hope you are already aware of some of the diagrams like uh, if you see a rhombus kind of structure that means it is a decision right yeah if you have a rectangle or a square kind of stuff then that means it is a statement okay so this is how it is before going further i will just give you uh, one very important point i don't know if you have got this question that 100% statement coverage covers 100% decision coverage was there any question like this uh, no no okay then 100 this also you can expect in your actually they had given a snippet and they asked like what is the statement coverage what is the branch coverage okay. that's why i asked you in the initial of the class is branch and decision same yes branch and decisions are same okay yeah but you can expect this question in your exam this time okay because this is one of the very important question in every alternative paper or all papers they do have this question they normally ask that 100% statement coverage covers 100% decision coverage or 100% decision coverage covers 100% statement coverage you can also make mm -hmm. it as branch coverage just as an example so what would be your answer here in this case so how to go with this question if you know the concept then this question is also simple to uh, solve now okay. if i draw like this first of all what is the meaning of decision coverage suppose you have something like this suppose this is the diagram decision coverage means this is the decision right a decision can have true or false as output okay then if you go for a decision coverage you have to cover both the part that means minimum for each decision you need, you need minimum two test cases yeah this this is clear up to here it is clear for decision it is clear yes normally a statement will be like this for covering one statement you need only one test case If it is a decision, then a decision will have two outcomes. That's why you need two test cases. Whereas for statement, with one test case only, you can cover the statement. Okay. Okay. Now, if I come here and if I talk about the statement coverage, what I'm talking about? I'm talking about statement coverage. How many statements I have here in this diagram? Just one. Just one. And which is here, right? Now... If yeah. I have to cover 100% statement coverage, I have only one statement. If I cover that 100% statement coverage will be done, right? Yeah, if you have, yes. So now if I cover- 100% decision coverage will lead to 100% statement coverage. Yes. So now here we have 100% statement coverage, but are we covering 100% decision coverage here? No. No. Okay, so this is the concept. For decision coverage, you need two parts. So if you cover decision, statement automatically gets covered. But if you only go for statement, decision will not be covered. All the decisions, possibility. If you have also one statement here, suppose you have this diagram. You have one statement here. You have one more statement here. In this case, if you go for only statement coverage, so you will cover this part, you will cover this part. Statement is covered as well as decision is covered. Mm -hmm. But here you can, you don't have that, uh, means you, you cannot cover 100% decision coverage here, okay? But we have to consider the worst case scenario. So that means if you have 100% statement coverage, you cannot cover 100% decision coverage. Whereas if you have 100% decision coverage, then you will always cover 100% statement coverage. Okay. Okay, so this concept is clear. No, I, I am very sure that you are going to get this question in this in your upcoming exam then. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
so did they give you something like this or in the form no, of it was actually a code it was actually a code okay then uh, i also have the code was the code big or it was small or something it was small it had to if and when else they asked how many statement coverage and decision coverage think, did you get right there or not sure mm, i think i got right there itself that's the reason i got points okay if that is the case because i also i do have some questions based on like where the where the codes are there but nowadays i have seen that they ask very simple questions so i also don't want to give a very complicated questions uh, question here to you okay i have a one i got it so let's solve this one here the question is okay mm -hmm. Yes, maybe if we have to solve this one, then uh, how many? Uh, Wait a second. This is unnecessary to go all the possible sequence of statements. Two test cases we need. Okay, so here they're telling that we have to consider the paths also, sequence of statements, paths for each program fragment. In this case, do we have to draw the algorithm and then check? It is always good to draw the algorithm and then check. Uh, actually, what is happening here? No, I don't know. Nowadays, I think the path coverage is not there. We'll skip this question because the path coverage is not part of, uh, of the foundation level. It is in the advanced level only. Because then okay. there is a different concept itself altogether, and I don't want to get into that. Maybe this type of questions also we can expect in the exam because these are small questions like this. It is a very small question, but uh, yeah, it is asking for statement and branch both. So they are asking like how many uh, statement coverages, how many test cases we need for statement coverage and how many for branch coverage. Yes. So uh, one, uh, one test for statement coverage and two for branch. Okay, let's check that. So normally I draw a uh, draw diagram here. So first two are the statements. So that's why we can represent it uh, like this. And then if statement, so this is a if statement. So this is a condition here. And then yeah. send an email. So you are sending an email. Okay. And uh, then some, you may ask me that, uh, how do we get this one? Because uh, now they have done then, but what if nothing, if the outlook does not appear, then it will skip this part, right? And then again, the program will end. Program has to end at the, uh, 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 towards the end, right? So this could be one path. And then another path is that it will skip this statement. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have this path here. So now the question was that how many test cases we need for the statement coverage and the branch coverage, right? So if you draw this one, so the statement will be cover covered and with this one, the branch will be covered. So you need one test case for the statement coverage and two for the branch coverage. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So this is what, this is the extent to which they ask uh, in the exam. And maybe I will call one more question. I have some very tough questions, but that is not required, I guess. So. Uh, just a minute. Actually, it's always good to draw the Flow chart. I mean, if it is a single statement, then it is fine. You know it, but like this means a uh, flow chart is good.
Uh, here we need uh, two tests for statement coverage mm -hmm. and two for branch coverage. Uh, yes, that's right because there is no nested loop here. Yeah. Yeah. So like this, you have so obviously you need only this one for the one for statement, right? Or two, you said. I said two for statement. No, you need only one for statement. <laughs> Okay, okay. And two for decision. Any doubts here? You want to explain certain part of it or you got the point? No, I think it's fine. Yeah. It's fine, right? Okay. Anyways, that that those were the questions based on the program, but uh, any program you get, it is always good that you transform it to a flow chart. Okay. And okay. that is the reason I also have a flow chart here just to show that uh, how it works. So obviously if you have a statement coverage, if you are looking for a statement coverage, then you have here one statement, you have one more statement here and another statement here. You have three statements here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now to cover this, you already know if it is a weekend else. So if you cover this part, Two statements are covered, one is still left out. So that's why you need another test case. Yeah. So if you draw a flow chart like this, you can draw it and then uh, you will get the answers also. Okay. This is one thing. Next one. In the decision also. So now here statement as well as decisions are covered. Yes. Okay. And if you have to calculate it in percentage, suppose with this, I want to calculate the percentage. So how many for the statement? So how many statements we have here? We have three statements. Yeah. So out of three statements, how many we covered here? Two. Two are covered. So it is two by three into hundred. Okay. If you if you have only written this test case, that means it is one divided by three into hundred. Mm -hmm. That's how we you cover it in percentage also. Okay. Okay. This is how it is. So now suppose this is the test case, then you, again, you have to see the statement. The statement is here, 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 and then also here. Okay. And then if we have to write the test case for covering, uh, suppose we cover only this part. So how much percentage we are covering? Uh, so it is two by uh, four. Two by four into hundred. So that means 50 percentage okay. we have covered. Now suppose yeah. we have also included uh, this part. Then it is it's still two by four. Why three by four? No, this is also statement. No, this is two, and then this is one, right? Okay, all together, you're saying right, right? Yeah. And this one, this one. If you only consider this, then this is only covered. No, this is not yet covered. Okay. Yes. Yes. This will be covered only if you go for this through this path. Right. So now you have four divided by four into hundred. Yeah, 100%. 100 is covered. And now when you have a nested if, how many decision coverage you need here? Now to cover this one, how many to cover 100% decision coverage, how many test cases we need? We need two. If weekend and if bank hold. Okay, else is there. Mm -hmm. One. With one, can you cover all the decisions? One minute. So when you are at decision, no, just hint. You have to cover this part. You have to cover this part. You have to cover this as well as you have to cover this. 
So now if you want to cover all these things, then how many test cases you need? Four. Okay, so here is the catch actually. You need only three because you can have one test case now where you will tell if weekend and if bank holiday both. Oh, okay. Then you are covering this else part and this else part with one test case itself. Again, you can have if weekend and I mean, sorry, this is not a holiday and this is a holiday. So you will cover this part. So you cover two yes, two else and one then. And now this then is pending. So for this, then you have to take another test case. Okay, but here they have given in separate decisions. So uh, is it okay that we uh, we say like and? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you you cannot stop your controller here. Mm -hmm. Controller, has, this is the start. Once you start from here, you have to reach here. Yes. So you cannot come from here and just stop here and make one test case and then for other test case you have to go straight it is not possible because once mm -hmm. you start from here you have to come until here whatever comes in between will be covered i mean did i answer your question or yes so for example what i'm saying is if you covered that if weekend else so you came here now you have mm -hmm. to take one decision whether you go here or here but you have to take one decision also here at this point Correct. You cannot stop here. So you have to take, if you take else one, then you have to take this one. And then finally you have to stop. So this is the point where you can stop. Now from same here, again, you came to this point. You already know that you covered this part. So you can take a deviation. You go to then, and then you cover this part. And mm -hmm. you have covered all the yes part. So it, this is still not covered. So you have to ne now next go to the then part. And then you have to come here. And then finally it stops here. So that's why you need one, two, and three test cases for decision coverage. Okay. Okay. So that's why if you have any question or in a uh, in a or a program they have given you, then it's always better to draw the flow chart. It will result in only two type of test cases. One is this one, other one is this one. Okay. Yeah. Okay then. Yeah, so I have covered both statement and decision in the backside only. Now they are covering the decision. Same thing. Okay. So that's why we can skip. Now, yeah. Sometime in question, no, you get while loop. Don't get confused. Just consider while loop as an if statement. Okay. You will have only two outcomes. So this do means this is supposed true. And you consider this as false. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if you mm -hmm. want, if they ask you for statement coverage, if you, you can just make it like this statement. Okay. Yeah. So here three are covered. So you had total four test cases. So three divided by four into 100. Okay. Okay. And then you can cover the else part of it. So with this, Two test cases are required for statement coverage. Similarly, two test cases are required also for decision coverage because you covered both the two and false part also, right? Yes. So that's why the I means what I mean uh, meant here is that you just have to consider that consider while loop as a if statement. Okay. One thing clear. So this is how, and I also told you how to calculate the percentage previously only. So this is what, these are the only two things which we have in the white box testing or structure based testing. Okay. So let me just see if I have only two or three slides means we will finish it off. And then, yeah, we just have two or three slides. Then we go for the lunch, right? Yeah. Very late maybe for the time now. Yeah, one five. So another 10 minutes we will finish and then two o'clock we will join back. 45 minutes I need today. Okay. okay. So now in the experience based testing, what we see is that uh, the error guessing. Error guessing technique or checklist also sometimes they tell. So let's see how it is. Uh, as you see that the, the user is guessing the error and to guess the error, the user should be experienced enough, right? That what can go wrong in this system. So how a user will get that experience is that either they have worked on the similar applications previously or the similar technology. 
okay sometimes kill of the user and the intuition also like they can intuit okay in this area the system may fail okay the next one is that the knowledge of likely defects and their distribution we saw previously also right in the experience based testing only that they know that maybe as i told you project 1 and project 2 so suppose previously last 3 years you are working on this project then you know that you know you have the list of defects so this list of defect you will bring here you will develop the test cases based on that and you will run it here just to see that if these test cases are able to find these bugs or not mm -hmm. and then experience of developers mistake so as a testing team when we are testing suppose we know that always at boundary they make mistake then this is the mistake which they are making and we directly go with the boundary value analysis here just based on the experience we have analyzed that okay so this is one approach where just tester is getting the data or they just have the experience and because of that they are doing they are able to do something but when we go for the structured approach then here what we are doing is actually we get the complete list of problems based on this list we develop the test case and then we run those test cases okay here they are just uh, predicting that okay what could be the defect but here they actually have the list from the previous project in this mm -hmm. case and then they execute their test cases okay and again this line is also very implement the experience based test technique complements the test design technique okay so if you see this statement in your exam then this is also a valid statement i also mentioned previously normally we should go with a formal test techniques and once that is done then we should go for a experience based technique yeah and again usefulness depends upon the testers experience how experience is the tester based on that uh, the success of this process uh, depends on cool. yeah <clears throat> when we go for exploratory testing so normally we do not have anything uh, means we don't have test design we means in the same in the same frame like if they are working for a half day or a half day or so in this only they design it means they don't write it also somewhere they just in mind only they design it they execute it and they log the, log the report okay so this mm -hmm. is how they work means in, uh, normally in all other technical processes what was happening is that until we go to the execution execution used to be the last step where every until then we used to make everything ready where we used yeah. to analysis design implementation all these things are done everything is done here only now in the experience based testing okay. this is one more difference okay and you may also hear the word that test charter you might be knowing because you are working in agile project so here they will in the test charter so yeah this is also one important term i have seen a question based on that what a test charter is a test charter will contain the goal the responsibility <coughs> oh, sorry maybe the objectives okay all these things will be mentioned in the test charter maybe the duration lot like this lot of things will be mentioned in your test charter okay now, who has to do what what is the scope of this testing all these things will be mentioned in the test charter time boxing means as i told you so normally what we do is that we do if this is one week of time so first four days we will do the normal testing and then on the last day or half day we will plan for the exploratory testing because this exploratory testing will never end right you can, we can do lot of combinations but then we want to restrict that that's why we make it as a time bound so whatever in this time you can do you do it okay okay yeah so on what all factors we choose the test technique so there are multiple factors it is always a context dependent okay like which system you are working on what type of requirements you have do you have re regulatory requirements which you need to fulfill strictly what is there in your contract and how much risk you have in your system what is the type of risk uh, in your system and what is the objective of your testing right mm -hmm. especially in case of uh, statement testing or decision testing our objective is to check at the boundaries the things so maybe we go for boundary value analysis here always because we want to check which which web which 
which values are valid for it, which values are invalid for it. So equivalence partitioning we can go. So these are some of the factors like what system we are working on, regulatory requirements, contractual requirements, level of risk, type of risk, and the objective. What are the documents uh, we can have? Means other other things are like what are the documents available to you? Again, knowledge of the tester. So based on the knowledge, the tester can decide that which technique we can go for, how much time and how much budget you have, which uh, development lifecycle model you are in, and use case model. So based on the use case, you also see that if, whether we have to apply boundary value analysis or state transition testing or decision table, like in which combination the user is going to give the input. So if you know the combination type of stuff, then it is decision table. And previous experience of the tester. So like this, multiple things are there, but uh, just go through these points, just keep it in mind. If any of these option comes uh, in the exam, then you can select it. Normally I have, I have not seen questions from this part. Okay. okay. And this some general points and a very important point also from the exam point of view, especially in these slides, which I have given you yesterday. No? If you see general points, please remember them because uh, they are the, like, like this only they will come in the exam. Okay, mm -hmm. so functional and non-functional testing can be used at all test levels. We can apply this at any test level, functional and non-functional. When we talk about structural testing, that is a white box testing. Here they are telling that it can be used at all test levels. So this wording is very important, can. Okay, mm -hmm. but most got you, you got, got the question I got. Okay, so this is a very important point. That's why it is in general points as, as I was saying. Then, yeah, the next part is that, but mostly used in component testing and integration testing. So mm -hmm. now you have to read the question carefully. They ask mostly used in. That means okay. your answer should be out of these two, or both mm -hmm. if they are in the same line, both. Okay. And to a very lesser extent, sometimes mostly, then sometimes they will tell least likely. Least likely okay. means system testing. Most likely means component testing or integration testing. Or if they, if they ask uh, that can be tested at all level, then answer is yes. Okay. Understood, no? Different type of combinations of questions which you can get from here. Yes. Yes, so this is also very important part. And with this, the chapter ends. The chapter number four. Uh, I think you need a little bit practice here. Uh, you, whatever this video, whatever we are recording, right? Maybe you have to go through this video again, I think, completely. Right? Yeah, I'll go through it. Yes, I know I need practice here in yes. Yes, at least Black Box into this, this four part. Because this is yeah. like definitely four to four, four to five questions you get from here. Uh, if you get this five right, I think uh, you can very easily clear this exam. Which is out of five, at least three also. If you get, I think it would be very easy for you to clear. Okay. Then, okay. so this is black box testing, five techniques, use case testing. I will see if I have some uh, scenario based question, but I see like I have already given you a question, right? So that is the, that is the type of question they will ask uh, in the exam. I think this time you will not get questions from here, use case testing. Anyway. Yeah. Then white box testing, you have statement testing, decision testing, then experience based testing, you have error guessing, checklist we already saw in chapter number three, and then exploratory testing. Error guessing means you have the list of errors, with that you can guess, or you have worked on previous projects, so based on that also you can guess the errors. Okay. This is it uh, from this chapter and uh, chapter five is also a very big chapter. Um, so let's start this around uh, two. Okay, around 2 p.m. we'll start this. Fine, right? Yeah, let's, from fine. From two to, I think, if, you, if we spend two to five, obviously with breaks, uh, we can finish it off, uh, this uh, chapter. Maybe in two hours we will finish, let's see, okay? Okay. Okay, then Kiran, then see you uh, at 2 p.m. then. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Bye-bye.
gaji tambahan. Ya, hai Kiran. Hai. Hai. Yes, I'm also in now. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I'm audible also, I guess. Okay. Then now we go to chapter number. Hold on. Yeah, so yes, okay. So, the reason behind uh, going wrong in chapter number two is what I could see. <clears throat> uh, here, a lot of points are there. I'm not sure if you, uh, I'm not sure if uh, there were a question based on like what is the task of the test manager. And what is the task of the tester? No, that question did not come. Okay, so this, this is one topic. There, there could be another topic. So after that, we get this planning and control. Based on that, we get some questions. And after that comes is uh, this one, uh, product risk. Mm -hmm. Yes, I had question from here. And project risk. And also there was like a metrics calculation. How would you calculate that? Uh, what type monitoring of... and uh, like the progress uh -huh. yeah so <clears throat> let's see if we can have a look into it it's normally if you have a progress means you have to see that what was planned previously and how much is achieved for example yeah. if we say that uh, some 100 test cases are planned okay and then if we achieve only 20 test cases out of that so if it is in percentage, then again, it will be 20 divided by 100. Hmm. Okay. So this is how it will go. But let's see, uh, uh, maybe at the end, we will again discuss that what was here. And then there is a last topic where we will discuss about configuration management and defect management. Okay. And the starting, it again starts with the independence testing. So these are the... Uh, few important topics here. So from this topic, definitely you're going to get some question. There would be some question from risk. Did you get a question from defect density? Defect density, no, but risk level, I got a question. <clears throat> risk level was a question. Then you can expect a question from defect density this time. Okay. okay. This is also one of the important question which is asked again and again. Okay, so yeah, so these are the topics and even what is the task of tester and what is the task of test manager. So here and in this topic, in both of these topics, okay, it is very closely like if you, if we need to really understand the topic to, uh, uh, to differentiate between them, mm -hmm. between the task, like how you understood, right? The, uh, what is the task of the, in the task, uh, what, what are tasks we do in the test analysis process or test design process. So it's yeah. also logical. It's not like that we are just by hearting it because it, then it is very difficult that to understand what is in which level. Uh, similar to that, 
here also it is like it we have to understand it logically otherwise it is very difficult to differentiate which task mm -hmm. is done by whom and similarly we also have to understand the product risk and project risk also completely okay. let's start with the lecture now so as we said or as we have also seen that um, the organization and the independence so with help with the help of some diagram we have already seen it i will also draw it here again <clears throat> So here the point is same thing like if you have an organization and then there is a team and in the same person is doing both development activity and testing activity so in this case uh, you will have a less independence then you go further then you have two people uh, one person is doing the development activity another person is doing the testing activity in the same team or you can have an organization where you have two different departments itself so here you have the development team and here you have the testing team or there are two completely different uh, organizations where you have de development team here and testing team here. So this okay. is, and this way you will, the degree of independence increases. Yeah, degree of independence increases. So this is actually the concept. And now in whichever format they give, we just have to see that how that, uh, in which scenario the tester is quite away from the developer. <clears throat> okay. So okay. that's how we can complete it. So this is all the thing which is mentioned here, but we can go to the next point. So this is also one important aspect here, the benefit of independence testing and the potential drawback. So some form drawback, sometime I've seen the question coming in. Let's go through the benefit, the, yeah, from benefit, <clears throat> all these three statements are very important because all these three statements I've seen coming in the question. Okay. So independent, independent mm -hmm. tester sees other and different defect. Okay, so this is very important point here that as an independent tester, we see the other and different defects. Then independent testers are unbiased. One more important term here. Then independent testers can verify assumptions made by the developers. Yeah. Okay. So during specification while because we get this requirement, the developers will also get the requirement and the testers will also get the requirement. And developers, suppose by reading that requirement, if developer has made any assumptions and implemented, but since we are also independently reading it and we will not make those assumptions, then we can find that what developer has done here, right? So that's why these three statements are very important. And even you can expect a question from this, this time that other and different defects unbiased. I already had a question. <clears throat> I had got the second point, independent testers are unbiased. Okay, so that's what I was saying. So this is quite important uh, point and always see some question from here. If you got from here, maybe this time from here, the drawback. Okay. So potential drawbacks are isolation from the development team. So suppose that they have made some assumptions here and you are both are in some different organization. Here is the developer, here is the tester. And then in a meeting they have discussed and they have made some assumptions here. And this is the authenticated assumptions. But there is a possibility that uh, by the time you are writing your test case, these assumptions didn't reach you. Okay, because you are in a completely different organization, right? So ideally it should go in the form of a com mail communication, you should get it. There are possibilities that some of these things, discussed things may not go to you. And then th that's the, that, that is why we have this point. Isolation from the development team. Okay. Yeah. The, and the next point is that developer may lose a sense of responsibility. This is also a very important point because the developers, they will develop the code. And normally if you have a tester here, so every time, every now and then you will get the feedback about your product and then you will see that, okay, this is how it should not work. But as a developer, if you pass it to other organization, when they test it, then finally they will just give you a report here and then this means this way you will uh, you will lose the sense of responsibility about the quality of the product. You think that it is not our job to find these defects. It's an another organization which is anyway responsible for it. But here you know that our organization is only responsible for it. Either tester finds it or not finds it out. At the end, it will come back to us only, right? So that's why yeah. developers may lose a sense of responsibility here. The other the main thing is also that that suppose we have a start of development and end of development so always test execution comes at the end 
right? If something goes wrong here, if means already they might have taken a lot of time here. Testers are only getting one week of time or two weeks of time towards the end. Here, if something goes wrong, then they always think then because of tester, testers are the bottleneck and they are the, we are blame, uh, they blame us for the delay. Okay. And then lacking the important information. So as I already mentioned that because we are working here, there is a chance that we may miss some of the information. So here the terms bottleneck or blamed for the delay is also like in the exam, if you see this line, you may think that it is some random statement. But it is not uh, even this one, like developer may lose sense of responsibility. You cannot connect that time in the exam with this, this sentence, right? You may think that this is not the correct one, but uh, yeah. this is the correct one. Isolation is also correct one. Bottleneck and blame for delay is also the correct one. Okay, so these three points here are also very important. Okay. Okay, I hope you get the sense of it. And then uh, once you have an exam, uh, you can easily mark these answers here, okay? So these uh, yeah. these words are quite important one here. <clears throat> now we need to see that what is the task of the test manager or test lead versus what is the task of the tester. Okay. Now how we understand there are a lot of points. There is no point in uh, by hurting them. But how you can understand is that you need to understand if there is a point which is covering the overall testing activity, which is applicable for test analysis, test design, test implementation, as well as for test execution. If it is applicable to all of these things, uh, then it is the task of the test manager. If okay. you, and if we are talking something about inside stuff, some any independent stuff here, then it is the task of the tester. Okay. Okay, so now what you need to do now here is that when when I'm reading these statements or when you are also reading the statement here only, just try to see that is it for the complete project or it is for the, how you get a sense that is it for the complete project they're talking about or any individual activity. For an example, first one. So it is coordinate, coordinate the test strategy and plan. So is it only for the individual activity or for complete testing we do this? So complete testing. It's always done for the complete testing. The test strategy <laughs> for the complete testing. That's why yeah. it is the task of the test manager. So this is how means now you didn't buy heard this right that this is the task of the test manager, but you read and then you saw that okay it is it is applicable for the complete project. That's why it is the task of the test manager. Now okay. write a review means the test policy for the organization. Okay, test strategy for the project. So mm -hmm. these things again, if they want to do. Manager. Correct. So this is again a task of the manager. Now contribute the testing perspective to other project activities, such as integration planning. <clears throat> what it means, what it means is actually normally you have seen this V cycle. So the testing perspective means this side. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now what they do is that this testing perspective, they cannot work in isolation right they also have to uh, means um, collaborate here with this side this side also right right hand side that what is yeah. happening here so based on that only they can make this plan so that is what whatever they are doing here uh, they will interact with the development side so contribute the testing perspective to other project activities so these are the other project activities they contribute Mm -hmm. And this is again overall level only that what we are doing in testing and what to contribute here is the task of the test manager to give this information. Okay. As a tester, we must we will only be working on these things, whatever is told to us. Then test the plan the tests. So again, it's a planning, so planning for the test. So it is again a complete activity. And initiating anything like initiating the test specification when the test specification should be written when it will be prepared when it will be implemented when it will be executed so it is all these things when all these things activity will happen is also a part of your overall planning right yeah and then monitoring the test result and uh, exit criteria so as a test manager, you will decide that whether we will come out of this testing activity or not. They, you will evaluate the result and then you will decide that whether we can come out of the testing activity or not. 
clear yeah okay. so that is why all these things are part of your test manager maybe you can just have a uh, look into all of these points just to see that um, if you are getting confused that yeah this can be done at the by the tester also do you have that type of understanding um, one minute No, none of these are done by the testers. Okay, so this is if this is clear, then let's move <laughs> to the next point. Again, this, uh, these are also part of the test leader only. For example, <clears throat> adapt the planning based on the test result and progress. So again, you as a test manager only, they are making the planning, and if they have to adjust anything into the planning, then again done by the test manager only. Clear, right? Okay. then take actions necessary to compensate the problems so in your project in any of these stages if any problem occurs then it is the task of the test manager to take necessary actions to come out of that mm -hmm. right it, normally in the meetings we tell right we are facing this problem then as a test manager they will tell that what you can do next or if this is completely blocked then they will give you the next task or other task for time yeah. being so that's how is this point here that take actions necessary to compensate for the problems we should, any job stopper or bottleneck is there means the, the the test manager has to give this idea like who can solve it hmm set up adequate configuration management of testware for traceability so uh, all the tools the uh, to set up these things it is the task of the test manager use uh, uh, testers will use these tools for traceability but setup will be done by the test manager means okay. they will bring this tool they will purchase the tool they will give it to the team then the team will start using it so the initial yes. setup the first setup will be done by the manager only yeah this point is also clear i think then yeah. introduce suitable matrices so we already saw that matrix means what that uh, uh, they will tell that before you reach the execution stage you should have written test case like 100% test coverage should be there so this is your matrix okay and uh, then this will be evaluated like a exit criteria also so what type of matrix we need will also be decided by the test manager what he needs what type of matrix he needs okay okay matrix related data will be provided by the tester so manager will ask i during your complete cycle uh, like here 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 whatever cycle you have i need this data this data this data and this data so as a overview level manager will tell that and as a tester when we are at this level we will provide that data to manager when we are at this level we will provide this data to the manager okay okay i hope it is clear decide what to automate and and to what degree so as a manager again as a test lead tech lead uh just manager and leads are different roles right yeah yeah one minute one minute i'll just <laughs> <clears throat> yeah so yeah you were telling no the task of test manager and tech lead it is again a context dependent uh, stuff okay okay sometime what happens is that you have a test manager then you will have two tech leads tech lead here and tech lead here uh, for your development activity and for your testing activity sometime you can have the complete test manager test manager here but what they are telling here is that from the overview level they are just telling that from overview level who will do the task and as a actual tester who will do the task okay okay so that's why they have made test manager and tech lead in one position and then tester in the another level 
Okay, fine. Okay. Uh, and again, yeah, so uh, for this release, what all things we have to automate and to what extent? So based on like, if it is an agile project that then manager will tell that we should go for a hundred percent testing, a hundred percent automation, or maybe 85 percentage automation, something like that. So as a manager, they will decide it. What product we have, what is the risk uh, and what all things we can achieve, what tools we have based on that, they will ask the team to automate that much. Okay, then Again, to select tools, I told you, the selection of tools, setup of the tool will be done by the manager yeah. or by the tech lead actually, right? Tech lead will also do the initial setup first. So that's why they have clubbed both test manager and tech lead. They don't want you to get confused between test manager and tech lead. Okay. Okay. Then organize any tool training for testers. So man, as a manager, they will plan, right? Training activities also. Yeah and decide about the implementation of the test environment. Again, like all the decisions level stuff will be done in the, by the manager and, also, by the lead only. So, and write test progress report and summary report. At the end, when test execution is done, we provide all the data. Then as a tech lead, they will prepare the report or as a test manager, they will prepare the report. Yeah. Okay, so this is how it is. So now it is clear, right? And maybe you can go through these points again. And just see that if you get confused between any point, like which is the task of the tester and manager, like in that way. Yeah, okay, we can go ahead. Okay. So they are just telling here that if you see any of these uh, names, right, they are just somehow similar only test manager, development manager, quality manager, or manager of the test group itself. So the roles are defined for all of these things uh, here in the, uh, for the ISTQB exam. Okay. okay. Obviously in the project, it varies based on multiple uh, factors. Okay. Even the test coordinator, if you, even if you see this word, and then you have to relate it for the overview who, who is taking care of it, right? Test manager, test coordinator like this. Only when you see a word tester, then now we will see the task of the tester here. Yeah. Okay. So obviously when you are uh, this, as I told the overview level, then obviously as a tester, you will be working on the analysis part or maybe in the design part or maybe in the implementation part or in the execution part any of these things so let's see review and contribute to the test plan so in the test plan they might have told to review and who will do the review maybe obviously tech lead also do but the peer review for the informal review also done by the testers here yeah right so now you review user requirement specification and model for testability so you see model for testability that is the part in the test analysis, right? You check for the testability. Yes. So that's why it is also task of the tester. Create test specification. So we had our, uh, our talk, right? The way of test case, test procedure, all these things will come under test specification. The part of design stage or maybe part of implementation stage. Some of implementation. it. Right. Then set up the test environment, part of the execution stage. Yeah. Identification may be done in the this one, but decision is made by the manager, but setup is done by the tester here. Okay. Then okay. prepare and acquire the test data. So acquiring of the test data is also done in the implementation stage, if you remember. Yeah. Right. Prepare, acquire, build. I told you that these three words, if you see it is for the implementation stage. So I hope these points are quite clear that these are yes. really done by the testers only. Okay. The some uh, some other tasks are that implement tests at all the levels. So who implements the test in the implementation level? It's the tester, right? 
so they will execute your test case they will evaluate the result they will also document the deviation so all these things are done by the tester only so it's quite clear then use test tool as required so i told you the setup of the tool will be done by the manager the purchase will be but the who will be using it it will be used by the tester yeah then automation of your test cases possibly with support from developers and the automation experts so if you are an automation engineer then you are the one who is working on it if you are not then you may take help of some developers or from the automation experts also okay clear right okay. Okay. Yeah. Next one, measure performance of component and system. So perform uh, this measurement is also done by the tester only because when you are in the statement coverage, you cover right how much percentage you have covered. Yeah. So again done by the tester, and review test developed by others. This is what I explained previously. So sometimes we also review the task done by other people as a tester. Yes. Okay. Okay. So those were the task of the tester and test manager. Okay. And now when we come here, test planning. Uh, the type of question what you are going to get is that uh, which of the following is the task of the tester? So three tasks will be of the manager and one task will be of the tester, or other way around. Yes. Okay. Or they also tell that which of the following is not the task of the tester. Mm -hmm. So that time be very careful with not word. Okay, means in an exam, right? Uh, on an average, people go wrong because of not likely all these most. If you ignore these words, no, because of anything, then there is a high chance that one or two questions you will make wrong in the exam. Okay. okay be careful with these words whenever they are there and ensure that you have read the question properly okay now when we are in the when we talk about the test process we already covered that the seven test processes are there planning monitoring and control analysis design implementation execution and completion and these part we covered in chapter number 1 and these are the two things which we will cover in chapter number 5 which is now okay okay so let's see and also let me know if you get some questions from these parts in uh, in your exam okay. yeah so quite a big topic i think which is still there after this mm -hmm. so it there is a four we do four activities here uh, okay yeah so here you have the planning stage then you have the estimation monitor and control so okay. in the planning stage what you actually do is i will just draw a diagram for an example like this suppose you have the analysis activity here then you have the design activity then you have the implementation activity then you might have a execution activity okay then so this is the road roadmap which we plan in the planning stage the, while making this thing we also estimate right until uh, how many days we need for the analysis so we do this estimation so during planning we also estimate so we will tell, tell that this will take one week this will take two weeks this will take another three weeks maybe and this will take only one week execution will take only one week now when we are uh, then comes the monitoring stage. So here you will continuously monitor whether within one week we are able to complete this or not. Within two weeks we are completely doing this or not. With the help of like your meetings, daily meetings and all we will have, right? So there this monitoring yeah. will happen. Once we see that there is a deviation, then what we have estimated or what we have planned when we see a deviation, that time the control mechanism will come into picture. So if they see that now the module is very complex, instead of one person, now we have to introduce two people, then that is a control action. Okay. okay. So this is what, this is how the monitoring and control are different. Monitoring is just looking into the deviations. Control means uh, reducing those deviations, do, doing, taking action so that we can reduce the deviation. Okay. 
so or another example is like you have planned that this is this should be our graph and you see that if the graph is going like this then you need to take an action so that you reach this graph somehow in future yeah. okay so this is a control activity this until here is this the monitoring activity this is what you have estimated previously right this is the estimation part this is what you estimated this is how it will go and this complete thing will come under your planning Hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So these are the just the overview which I wanted to tell. Now let's go with the planning activity. So what all things we do in the planning? <clears throat> so again, it is very simple. In the exam, if you get question from planning, control, analysis, design, implementation, and execution, I hope. these part is parts are right now clear now we are into this part so this planning is nothing but covering this overall right so now if we yeah. see the statement we will see that only that determining the testing scope risk and objectives so what is the objective of our testing what is the scope until what extent we should test and what are the risk associated with our system that will be uh, planned in the starting then defining the test approach like how many test levels we need and uh, what would be the exit criteria and what would be the entry criteria so for example they see that we have a product where we don't need integration testing so we will only have component testing and then we will directly have a system testing we don't need integration testing in our uh, project so these are the test levels so you have only two test levels in your project now okay so this is what will be decided in the planning stage this is clear right so oh, you are on mute maybe yes sir oh sorry yeah, yeah i'm clear okay then <coughs> integrating and coordinating testing with development i already gave you this example that you will have b cycle so when the uh, when the execution of component testing should start totally depends upon the development activity so this coordination is also part of your planning yeah okay then making decision about what to test who will perform the testing activity how uh, how the activity shall be done with the help of tools or manually it should be done like that how results should be evaluated okay so these okay. are like making any type of decision is also in the planning stage and any type of scheduling activity when the analysis should start when the design should start when the implementation execution or evaluation should start all these things here scheduling will be done by the in the planning stage and assigning resource to different activities defined so resource allocation everything is done in the planning stage only right is it clear yeah so if you want to go through these points so that it will reduce your little bit uh, burden of reading everything at the end maybe let's go through these points okay it's clear okay mm -hmm. or anything which you want me to explain little bit more uh, so so fine no that's fine that's fine okay then let's move ahead okay some more task like defining the test documentation test means what type of document you need like you have this v cycle right after different stages component integration testing system testing acceptance testing so at the end what all documents we have to provide is also part of the planning stage initially only they will tell once we test these are the things which we need as a output okay yeah. 
then selecting matrices for monitoring and control so we already told that the matrix like what you need what data you need at the end of this testing or during the testing what type of data you need is also planned in is also defined in the planning stage itself like how much percentage of preparation is done how many test cases are executed defect resolution how many defects you had out of these defects how many defects are fixed risk related issues like if we get any new risk here so that is also part of the or how many new risk we got so that is also part of your matrix only here okay and then yeah. setting level of detail for test procedure for repeatability so I gave you one example, right? Suppose you have a lot of projects here and here you define one high level test case. So to what extent we have to define this high level is also defined in the planning stage so that it can be used in all the other projects afterwards. Okay. These are the three main points again that defining the testing documentation, controlling, monitoring and controlling and uh, setting levels of detail for test procedures for repeatability. Okay. Is it uh, too much or it's happening properly that you are able to still concentrate? <laughs> Lots of theory uh, here now. Uh, yeah, I know this chapter has a lot of theory. Yeah. That's why I'm just making sure that you are also reading it uh, so that after this you need only one time reading and then you are through for the exam. Mm -hmm. It's fine, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can go ahead. Okay. Uh, from exam point of view, this is not very important. It's not important, okay? Uh, it is just, uh, just an example to show you that what our test plan uh, consists of in general. So okay. you will have a unique identifier for your test plan. Then there will be an introduction. What is the purpose of this test plan uh, and uh, yeah, look, uh, which level it is focusing on mm -hmm. and features to be tested. So normally in uh, what happens is that in the test, uh, normally you will get, normally you get lots of features from customer. Then you will have release one, release two and release three. Then they will make a matrix that in uh, release one, these are the two features will go. In the release two, these three features will go. In release three, only one feature plus bug will go. Bug fix will go. So like that, they will one have one matrix. But this is also a part of your planning only. In the planning, they will mention this, that, okay, this is what we have to do. So features to be tested and features not to be tested. So here, other things you don't have to test. Then what type of approach you will follow? Okay, like... If you are a very experienced team, then you can directly go with experience-based testing. If not, then uh, maybe specification-based testing, something like that. The approach also they will decide. Okay. What is the criteria for passing or failing the test case? Okay. Then suspension criteria and resumption criteria. You are aware of smoke test, right? Yes. So which is done in the starting. So this is like a suspension criteria. If the smoke test does not pass, then we will not continue with our testing. So like, this is also part of your planning only. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, event. so like test deliverables. So I also mentioned you, right? That you have different, different stages. So what are things you have to deliver in which stage? Also clearly defined in your planning. Environment related de details, like which lab you are using and uh, uh, yeah, which lab you are using, what are the tools? What is the software? What are their versions? All these things will be mentioned in your test plan. Staffing and okay. training needed. Sometime like nowadays, uh, whenever someone wants training, uh, start testing, they always have a requirement that you should, you must be ISTQB certified. That's uh, mm -hmm. also nowadays it is started. So that's why then, then training is required for that. Uh, and then responsibilities also will be defined. Who will be the tech lead for this project? Who all are the testers? All these responsibilities will be mentioned and who is working on which module, okay? Then yeah. obviously the schedules are mentioned. So we have drawn this diagram, right? When is when, what will happen? So that scheduling, 
risk and contingencies like what are the risk with your project and what all things you cannot achieve with your project that is what and then approvals so once the testing is done whose all approvals are required before we give it to the customer mm -hmm. okay okay so, <clears throat> so as a part of planning all these things uh, can be included but from i think exam point of view this is not at all important this is important for the defect actually so what are the content of a defect but not what is the content of a test plan yeah okay okay so now the, the very two very important concept did you get any question from entry criteria and exit criteria last time uh, no no i did not get maybe this time also you can expect this so entry criteria means for example you want to go for testing mm -hmm. what is the minimum thing what you should have you should have a software with you right this is the entry yes. criteria that you must have a software inside mm -hmm. that you can also have an entry criteria that that it should pass the smoke test yes then only you will start your testing when your testing will end so you might have planned some 100 test cases so once you reach once you reach this 100 test cases then you will come out of this testing activity so this is your exit criteria this is your entry criteria so entry criteria defines when to start yeah exit criteria defines when to stop and at each level, we have entry criteria and exit criteria. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So now we will see some of the example of entry criteria and exit criteria. Okay. Okay. So as I mentioned, if you read a statement now, and if you see that these are the things which we need for our testing. Mm -hmm. then that will be your entry criteria for example availability of testable requirement right so anything where like normally the word availability need something like that if you see the word then it is like entry criteria for you okay availability of the test item whatever you want to test that you need availability of the test environment obviously if you don't have an environment you cannot start testing availability okay. of the test tools if you don't have tools which you have planned, you cannot start testing. Availability of the data. If it is not there, you cannot start your testing. So you can just see that everywhere availability is there. Maybe you can mm -hmm. go through it once and then you move to next one. The second point availability of test items that have met the exit criteria for any prior test level yes so for example you are in the component testing and as i mentioned in your project you can have next as a system testing for an example yep. okay then what will happen is they will have one exit criteria here for the component testing that uh, minimum 95 percentage of the mm -hmm. coverage should be done so here as a system testing also you will have one entry criteria saying that if the 95 percentage of the statement coverage is done then only start the state system testing okay. so this okay. is coming from your previous stage to this stage okay apart from this you will have another entry criteria also but this will be one of your entry criteria yeah. okay. uh, other one is like you are working on the requirement level and you want to start the design activity you want to refer requirement in the design so they will tell that in the requirement level you should not have any critical defects so exit criteria of your requirement will be that there should not be any critical defect and entry criteria of design will be that there should not be any critical defect in your requirement right so that way okay 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 so now this is all about entry criteria so entry exit criteria when you read that time you think that once we reach that we can stop our testing mm -hmm. now if i read the first statement you will understand what i am saying planned test have been executed whatever you planned you executed mm -hmm. that so yes. you will stop your testing a defined level of coverage has been achieved okay 
so here you are achieving you are get you are meeting the uh, whatever you have decided previously so you have achieved the coverage like they tell that 100% coverage should be there that means 100 test cases means 100 test cases you should run so you have yeah. reached the target uh, next point is the number of unresolved defect is within an agreed limit so mm -hmm. there is also a possibility that they will tell that we will only release to the customer when we have defects less than five in number less than five yeah. so this could be your again exit exit criteria only right until you meet this you cannot exit from the testing activity correct right. the number of estimated remaining defect is significantly low same point okay it is yeah. less than what we thought then Again, you can also check the, the evaluate the level of reliability performance. You will say that the response time should be less than one second until mm -hmm. it is uh, less than one second. We will not release a product to the customer. So exit criteria again. So any type of thing which you want to achieve, then it is a exit criteria cost and time. Sometimes this is the point you have to release it to the customer, whatever is the state. You have to, you have reached here, but you could not complete your testing. Still, it is delivered to customer. Yeah. Okay. By okay. obviously, we will mention that. Okay, these are the defects. These are the thing in it. But yeah, this is the state right now. So you, we will mention the proper state and deliver it. Mm. Okay. Same thing is with cost. It is also has to do with the cost also that customer is not ready to pay for the extended testing cycle. So this is all about the exit criteria. So maybe you can also have a have a reading here. Probably they'll give a set of four options and they'll ask us to uh, select one which is exit or entry criteria. Yes. Example. Yes. yes. Okay. So here everywhere is the difference between only you have. That's why this chapter is a little bit tricky if you, uh, we do not understand completely. Na? Mm. Then we have problem. Because you see the test manager, then came tester. This one. Yeah. Now you yeah. see that entry criteria and exit criteria. This one is another difference between only. So here we need to know a lot of points you can see that already some 40 points we have covered 10 10 10 10 yeah a lot of information to, uh, to go through okay yeah. yeah next one then that uh again everything is context dependent in testing right you cannot have a master thing for all the all the projects all the product so what is your test policy of that organization so based mm -hmm. on the test policy, you will have the test planning. What is the scope of testing? Are you working for component testing or are you working for system testing? Your planning will change, right? That's yeah. what. Again, the objective, what type of defects you want to find? So that will also change your planning. Risk associated, mm -hmm. what are constraints you have? Any critical stuff like risk related or what you want to test? Same thing, component testing, system testing and the availability of resource. So if you see that you have only two testers, you need four testers, then your planning will be different. Okay. Yes. Means in your planning, you also have to include the hiring process. If you have all the four testers, you don't have to include the hiring process in your plan that until when the next person should be available. Right? Mm -hmm. So likewise, so these are the factors which influences the planning, but mm, I don't see any question coming from this part too. Okay. Next one uh, important term is what is test approach. Okay. So the test implementation of the test strategy. So first you will have test strategy to implement this test strategy. You have test approach. Okay. In the project. And uh, there are different type of strategies here, like analytical strategy, model based strategy, uh, method based strategy, or uh, compliant based or standard based strategy. Uh, we have seen no, like, if it is a MISRA guideline, so they tell in the standard what things to be do, what, what we should do, what we should not do. So that you will take as a reference and you will do testing. 
reactive yeah. method reactive method means uh, like uh, experience based testing where you see how the system is behaving based on that you write your next test case then you see how the system is behaving you write your next test case mm -hmm. so reactive based directed based like uh, if the customer has told you or the stakeholders has told you to test in certain way so that is a directed way and uh, regression errors i have not come across uh, maybe i also have to go through it but this is also one of the test strategy analytical means you already have some data so based on that data you are performing some testing activities from previous yeah. project or something model based testing means you nowadays we have matlab model so in that the requirement might be there so based on that you uh, you start your testing uh, approach or other one is that sometimes you have a tool in a editor uh, where they will tell that this zero is for start uh, this is for uh, writing any statement this is for end and uh, you can use this arrows for transition so using this they will create the model in the, like designing part of it like this they will create a model and once they execute means once they press one button the test case the test scripts will come out of it this test mm -hmm. script they can use for execution okay so what type of strategy they follow that is also one thing here but the important part in this complete this part is that the implementation of test strategy for a particular project so the test approach is used to implement the test strategy okay if a statement comes something like that what is test approach then just remember this definition again everything previously we saw test plan is a uh, is based on uh, test plan is a context dependent now test approach is also context dependent what type of approach you will take based on the risk of the failure what will happen if system fails okay then hazards and safety means if it is a safety critical feature or it's a non safety related feature so based on that also your approach changes again availability of resource and skill so if she, if you have a team member who has good skill then you can go with lots of this test design techniques but if they are not aware then we cannot go with it so something like that to be based on how that how the team we have we have to follow the is based on that we have to select a test approach again the technology and nature of the system for example if you go for commercial of the self package so as we mentioned one software will be there one software will be here so we have to see that the interaction between them is correct or not so your approach will be that we will go for integration testing here right. right so this is how it is then test objectives and any regulations legal standard all these things if they are there based on that also approach can be selected okay maybe you can also go through it and let me know if you need any detail Available resources and skills is also part of uh, test planning, right? Yes, test planning also and also part of the approach. Approach, okay. Because obviously if you have less people, then your approach will be different. If you have more people, then you can think of doing more things, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if this test objectives done, also be defined in uh, plan. Yes, planning. also in the planning. Yeah. Again, uh, here this is just a topic of uh, going through, but not very much relevant from the exam point of view. Okay. Going to next part. Yeah, I means not very important, but obviously we should read it once. We never know how good or bad is our day that day. Yeah. <laughs> we have to be careful also okay so with this all the planning related stuff done and now we go to the test estimation a very simple topic of this so we have two type of approaches that is one is the matrix based approach and one is the expert based approach matrix based approach i have also explained previously that you have project one you have project two 
so from project one you will have some data already because you are working on it then you can use that data here in for project two so metric from former or similar project okay and expert based training is also a similar thing like uh, uh, estimates from the owner of the task so there maybe there is a tech lead who has worked on lots of projects previously like p1 to p n and now they know that which feature takes how much time and based on that they plan they provide the estimation okay okay there is no uh, documentation how they are assigning this task but based on their experience they are uh, telling that this much time it should take okay so two approaches here for estimating the and now the test effort it's not very simple thing like test effort so even the tech lead he knows all these things but he is going to assign this task to some persons only right so yeah. it then depends like how good are they or how much experience they have like this so there are multiple factors uh, or, or based on which uh, the uh, the planning um, is the test effort depends on so there are three things which they have told here like the product the characteristics of the product itself the characteristics of the process you are following and the people and the outcome of testing so let's see what are all of these points i think this is also one important point here that this topic so effort depends upon the quality of your test basis how good is your requirement the more good the requirement is the less effort other people will take afterwards yeah size of your product obviously if the product is very big then it's going to take a lot of effort if it is very small then it's going to take less effort complexity of the problem domain so again what type of technology we are working on based on that the complexity is defined then reliability security requirement uh so because the security related requirements takes lot of time if you want to check the reliability testing if you have to do the reliability testing then also it takes lot of time so here how much reliability you want to test and suppose it is a banking domain then here the security will be more security testing is required whereas if it is a some toys or some other websites comparatively the security would be testing would be little yes. less here yeah then this is the security requirements and then risk associated with your project so obviously if it is a toy the the, the risk is very less here but if it is something else like car automotive or avionic industry something like that then you have more risk so you have to test more also there mm. okay then people means the stability of your organization so if it is uh, your organization is quite stable working from long time long duration then obviously you know that things and that you may take less effort but if it is a very new organization new people then the effort is going to increase for the same task and in testing if you are using tool or you are not using any tool that also depends uh, based on that the effort will increase test processes so if you have a test process where lot of documents you need to produce then it will take lot of time for completing the task okay uh, in agile we go for the lightweight model right light documentation so there it will be little fast again skill of the people and time pressure also so sometime when you put more time pressure then the effort will be less i'm not sure about the quality the quality may reduce but the the productivity will increase here something like that the so time pressure is also one more aspect here mm -hmm. maybe you can just go through it once uh, just to see outcome of testing you did not cover ah uh, sorry outcome of testing right so like once you do testing suppose you have found lots of defects here you found mm. three defects then obviously the effort of fixing will be more right instead of if you yeah. go, have got five defects so that is what one thing again obviously you found more defects the more retesting will be required the more regression testing will be required so that mm. is how the effort will increase or decrease is clear 
In this section, how possibly they can ask the questions? Um, that's what direct question. If they ask, it is going to be a direct question only. That based yeah. on which all factors the effort uh, varies, then they will give all these options. Oh, okay. Maybe one option will be all of the above, none of the above, something like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that is all about estimation. Now we are into the monitoring stage. As we already know that what is the meaning of monitoring? It is nothing but a feedback. For example, in our meeting, what we do actually, we give the feedback, how much we have done, right? So, yeah. so we provide the feedback about the test activity, provide visibility of the test activity, enables measure of the exit criteria. So we provide the feedback, then test manager will see it is in line with our timeline or not. If yes, then it is meeting the exit criteria. If not, the manager will take the necessary action here. Okay. Okay. And how you, will you see the progress? Obviously against the scheduled planning and the budget whether we are able to complete within that budget or not, or, <clears throat> or if we, uh, with the planned schedule, if we are going or not, whatever we have planned, if we are, when we are monitoring it, we see that whether we are sticking to this plan or not, that is the monitoring activity here. Okay. I think from here, you got some topic. Yeah. From this part. So this is what is uh, from where you get uh, from where you got the one question uh, this time, right? So this is the percentage of work done. So yes. I'm not sure how the question was there, but uh, they might have told that how much percentage of work is done, how many test cases they have executed or something like that or something different. And you cannot recall it. Actually, they gave a formula and uh, they interchanged uh, words between percentage and product. Mm -hmm. I don't exactly remember the options, but uh, that was a little tricky for me to answer. Okay. Okay. Let's see. But yeah, since you got the question from this topic, it's also one probability that you're not going to get. But I'm not able to recall any questions based on that because I have not come across. Okay. So let's see. But this is how the percentage usually is calculated that uh, we see that what is planned uh, and then where we are. And, uh, what is the gap between this is the percentage gap. Yeah. But I'm not sure about the question like how. Uh, let's see. I will try to search if some questions uh, are there in the internet. Okay, then yeah, there is a very important term. Yeah, like one more thing is execution. How many test cases executed? How many test cases not executed? How many test mm -hmm. cases passed? How many test cases not passed? All these things are represented in percentage format only, right? Yes. Then there is the important term out of all these things. What I see is that you already got a question from this part. Now I expect this question. Density. Expect density. Okay, for this, uh, one minute. I will just, uh, in the internet, I will just type something and then I will bring it here. <clears throat> Effect density. STQB. Yeah. So this is the definition, uh, the number of defects identified in a component or system divided by the size of the component or system. Okay, but I see the code here. 
sorry i don't see the current screen that you are referring to okay uh okay it's like yesterday's problem might be now you see the yeah. yes okay so i don't know why it went to that screen anyways <clears throat> so here the number of defects identified in a component or system divided by the size of the component or system okay okay so this is the definition now i will tell you what is the meaning of that but you have to remember this definition the number of defects identified in a component or system so component divided by size of the component system divided by the size of the system okay okay this is how it is but uh, why are you not able to see the screen which i am sharing uh, not this one let's go through this uh, now you see uh, yeah now i see test management screen test management screen right but you only see test management or right hand side also you see next slide something like that yeah lecture notes yeah this why i don't know why it goes to always to this screen i don't know understand now you see only one screen means one document right yeah but it has slightly shifted to the right hand side so only half of the screen is visible okay then i do one thing i stop sharing and then i reshare yesterday this happened that it switched and today again so you don't see the lecture notes now right you just see the slides uh, screen yes. still now it is fine yeah okay so normally you just let me know when the screen uh, switches right because i am i am not able to see it how it is visible to you but usually you see you should see a screen like this only okay okay so yeah so i was at a point so what they are telling here is defect density what is the meaning of defect density here that okay. <clears throat> suppose you have a function this function has suppose 20 lines of code okay, okay. and you find defect in two lines so defect density is 2 divided by 20 into 100 okay this is the size of your component this in these many lines you had a problem and into 100 so this is how a defect density is calculated but they never ask this type of questions in exam they directly ask the definition of defect density mm -hmm. recently i have seen two people they have told me that uh, two or five people maybe Yeah, recently i think three four people they have told me that they have got this question defect density and this was the answer that uh, the component divided by the size of the component so component or system divided by size of the component or system yeah okay so this is what you have to remember here in this uh, this slide and uh, i am very optimistic that this question you will get this time okay then there are some or more matrices like test coverage how much percentage of requirement you have covered and in the planning stage you will have the risk also right suppose you had 10 10 risk so did you cover all the 10 risk in your testing or not and then the code coverage you anyways know static testing and sorry uh, statement testing and decision testing will come into picture the coverage dates of the test milestone this is also a matrix that which when we will have which type of release So this is also a matrix. Testing cost. So this is for manager that they will also track of the testing cost, and the test completion, resource allocation, and usage and effort. So like how much percentage of the task you have completed, how many resources are involved. Out of those resources, how many we are using, and how much effort we are putting for which module. So all these things are matrices only. Okay. Okay. so okay. once they get all this data then maybe if in this release even this project it is not useful but in the next release it might be useful for the next mm -hmm. release one or for the next project also some of the data 
might be useful. So we saw, right, like based on the project one and project two. So sometimes we take data from project one and use it in project two with modification. So for that, these matrices are required. Okay. Okay. Then reporting, the, uh, the summarizing of information about the testing endeavor. So during the testing, complete testing, whatever all things we did, so we have to summarize that. So all five days, whatever we have done, finally we have to summarize that. So that report usually consists of like um, what happened during a period of testing, whether we have met the exit criteria or not, okay, such as that one. And uh, what has been tested? So what worked, what didn't work, and what has not been tested? Or any risk you got, new risk. So in the planning stage, you had few risks, 10 risks maybe. Now during testing, did you find some more risk? Then you have to add this. So it will become 12 risks or 13 risks like that. Okay. okay. So all these things we will get, and it will help us in the summary report if you mention that what you have tested, what you know, have not tested, how many risks are there, all these things, then it will help us in defect outstanding, like how many defects are there in your system, whether there is any economic benefit of fixing those defects, how many outstanding risks are there, how many we have planned, did the risk increase, decrease, how much we have covered, and the level of confidence at the end. Okay. So that is what I was telling that you will get the confidence only when you have the report with you previously. Yeah. So this is about this, this uh, chapter. And now this is also sometimes very important. What is the what what uh, what is the content of the test report or test summary report? Yeah. I hope I am not sure if you got the question or not, but this from this topic also I've seen multiple times question. So obviously the summary report will contain summary of the testing performed, right? This is a short, short thing. Then information on what occurred during a test period. Okay. Okay. What all things have occurred in the test period? Deviation from the plan will also be mentioned. Your status of testing, factors that have blocked the progress. If you are doing something and because of something you are, could not go like smoke test failed so mm -hmm. this is the factor which is blocked so you can mention mention this also in the testing then what all matrices you have collected during your testing activity also will be documented in the summary report that this these all matrices we have gathered then the risks also will be mentioned like if you have some open defects then the development team will tell that how severe it is or how much priority we have to give it to it. And this priority or severity will also be mentioned in the report. Okay. Okay. And then reusable test work products. So at the end, you also have, you can also mention that what all things you can use from this cycle of testing, like some test cases, we can use the test environment. We can use all these things also we can mention in the summary report. So also important topic, maybe you can go through it and then again, let me know if you need to know more about any point. Yeah, we can go ahead. Mm -hmm. So actually, I, uh, I was just thinking that uh, you got nine questions from this chapter, right? And I think only two or three was uh, correct in that. But uh, out of these nine questions, have we covered most of them or not yet? It has not yet come into the slides, the questions which you have got. Out of nine, I got four correct. Four, okay, four you have got correct. So five was remaining, but I just wanted to know that these nine questions have we covered somehow, some or the other way or not yet? Out of nine, some things till now. Yes, we have covered. Covered a few of them. I think I now two more questions we will cover anyways. One is related to the defects. 
other one is the project risk and product risk and yeah one more risk so three questions we still have i think yes, these will yes. cover anyways so yeah so i think that is what is remaining okay can you can we take a break i'll go get coffee yeah fine this even i was thinking the same uh, i also need some time okay then <laughs> 15 minutes break we will take then now here yeah. yeah okay then yeah thank you
Yeah. Thank you, Renee. I'm also back now. Yes, Sujit. Okay. Actually, after lunch, it is very difficult <laughs> to. It was actually, uh, and if it was something practical, okay, uh, my mind would be alert. But it was so theoretical that I was yawning in the middle. So I thought, okay, this is not going to help out. Yes, yes, yes. Even actually, I was just about to tell you after this control because we have these four activities, now. Yeah. So this was the last activity. So after that, even I had a plan of taking break only. It's another two slides okay. only. Uh -huh. So let's complete this control activity. Okay, so okay. Uh, test progress, monitoring, and control. So here, if we see, so as I have already mentioned, that this is the planning which we do, and then if we see that the planning, what we planned here is somehow not completing here, but somewhere here it is completing. If we see that, I mean, somewhere we are here only, we are monitoring the activity and then we find that, okay, we planned here, but it is a little bit shifting here. So can we live with it? That is one thing. Okay, it's okay if it is shifted this much or if we don't want, we want it back to this place. Then we have to take some action. Okay. So that is what control activity. Guiding or corrective actions taken as a result of matrix gathered so this was i told you are gathering the matrix like the meetings itself so the manager is gathering the matrix and then see that okay it is somehow getting shifted in that case the manager will tell that okay uh, let's take these actions or corrective measures uh, or they will guide the team that uh, what they can do and based on that we will bring back to the original plan so this is all about the uh, control activity So this, uh, whenever they, we take any uh, corrective action, then it may affect the testing activity itself. So it means testing activity means sometimes we can increase the time or if there is a weekend, sometimes they also plan to work on weekend, something like that. So it may affect the testing activity as a overall and any other life cycle activity. So could also uh, affect the development activity also, not only testing activity. <clears throat> okay. So uh, this one making decisions based on the based on based on from test monitoring. So you from the matrix which you get from test monitoring based on that you make a decision. You may reprioritize your tests. Okay, mm -hmm. when you identify a new risk in your system. So whenever the project unfolds, there are a lot of places where we see that there is a risk in your project, and then we have to reprioritize our uh, testing because during as I already mentioned during planning suppose you found two risks 10 risks and then during the testing you found some another two or three risks then you have to reprioritize your planning yeah uh, and change the test schedule itself that's what i told you that uh, if if it is here and we see that it is we cannot achieve it then let's reduce the test plan and then give a new timeline okay that is also uh, part of the corrective action on your action and retesting and Anti criteria required requiring fix to have been retested by the developer before accepting them into a build. So this is something related to smoke test only, I would say. So you the once the developer gives you the code and then you find that uh, the smoke test failed for it, then the development team has to do re uh, resetting any entry criteria. So it's uh, okay. This is different point little bit. For example, you want to start your testing. Okay, and then you see that the smoke test failed. Okay, then what you will tell that, okay, we had 10 smoke tests and out of that, suppose four failed, but two passed. So then we will identify that, okay, these two test cases belongs to which feature. So instead of halting the project here, they will tell that, okay, you continue with testing with these two features. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, okay. we will fix these, these four features we are fixing, we will give you the fix. But meanwhile, you test these two features and any problem is there, please provide us the result. So we can also change our exit criteria. Okay. So that is resetting. I by mistake read retesting. Retesting also possible if you completely uh, reject it, it's saying that we cannot test it further because all the test cases failed. And then yeah. will be a retesting will happen here. So right now it is resetting. So with this, all the uh, all the stages are covered here. 
okay like the planning stage the estimation stage the monitoring stage and the control stage so in the planning stage we have covered uh, this the the task during the task test plan manager and tester yes so above this tester and test manager and then entry criteria and exit criteria we covered and then what is test approach and then we also covered factors affecting test plan or test approach test approach yeah and then when we were in the estimation we saw two type of estimation one is matrix based, matrix -based and experience based and experience based right yeah. and then when we were in the monitoring stage then uh, we covered that uh, like once we do the execution then we see that how much percentage of the execution is covered and yeah. here in the requirement stage we see that how much percentage of the requirement is covered and then we covered a very important topic defect density defect density is uh, um, it is uh, component or system divided by the total uh, fix of component or system. The size of the component. Size of component, of component or system divided by size of the component or system. Okay, yeah. so this is what is this definition. And then control activity is nothing but any corrective actions which you take so that you can meet the deadline or you want to skip the deadline or something like that. Okay, so that is a control yes. activity. Okay. Now we are towards the end of this chapter and uh we can expect so here you got two questions and from here you got actually one question in your exam yeah so we will uh, okay whenever we have configuration management right so with this there is one word which will uh, always go with it is version control, yeah, control. or yeah. identification so it is required yeah. for that purpose and defect management we know that it is for the uh, logging on the defect and maintaining the life cycle of the defect yeah so when we go to risk management so here in this topic we are going to see what is risk what is, yeah what is risk level and then we will see the project risk and product risk okay so these yeah. are the topics which we are going to cover here and with this the chapter number five will end so let's start with this configuration management most of the time when you when you read a question, you will come to know that it is about the configuration management because it is a little bit different, right? So yes, that's right. And one more thing, what you need to know here is that configuration management is not strictly a test by used by testers. It is yeah, it is used by the developers. Developers. Yes, it is actually used by the developers, but as a tester, we also store our test artifacts here, test wares in this. So this is to maintain uh, establish the establishment and maintenance of the integrity of the products okay i have to keep my laptop into charging okay yeah what we we do here is i mean i will go through this definition afterwards because it will not make any sense if we don't understand the overview of it suppose we did testing in this is our first release this is our second release so what we do is once we do testing we store all this data that is our test wares of testing one and then here we also also st store the test wares related to that why it is required like in future if customer comes and tells that you are in the suppose n number of testing right now but customer the customer wants you to test something on uh, on uh, on the release what you made during the testing one whatever you have released during testing one right in this topic, yes. he wants you to test. That time you need all the test ways related to this release because this there is a possibility you might have changed your test cases here during this time. Or maybe obviously here when you are in the during end of your release, you are most of things which would have been changed. You cannot use this test case to test this uh, software now. So that is why you, we want to uniquely identify the data. That's why we have this uh, uh, configuration management tool here so the establishment and maintenance of the integrity of the products of the software or system through the project or product life cycle so that's mm -hmm. what we are doing here we are maintaining the integrity of this data we are maintaining the integrity of these data also throughout the project life cycle okay. yes yeah and then all items of test pair are identified we can identify them very easily. Yeah. 
Yes. So we can identify any of these items um, uh, easily. They are version controlled because we provide a labels to them uh, here. Mm -hmm. Then tracked for the changes. We also know that what, what we changed from this release to this release because while storing, we also put the comment what we changed. Then we once we store this one again, we put our comments what we changed from here to here. Okay, so this way we will know that from this release to this release what changed. Yeah. So tackle for changes related to each other like this one and then related to the development item. So related. So testware. What is the change between testware and testware? And why we cannot test this testware with this one? That also we know. Or how many test cases we can test from this one? That also we will know. So that is what to each other and to the development activities. These two points related to each other and related to the development items. Okay. Related to each other. Okay. Hmm. Then all identified documents and software items are referenced unambiguously in the test documentation. So without any confusion, uh, you can select the test ways because they are stored with the labels. So if you go to one level, then only things related to that level will be visible to you. So there is no yeah. possibility that you, you take these items here and then do testing. So that's why it is unambiguously you can select the items or identify the item. And how to store these things, everything will be stored in your, uh, it will be documented in test planning stage itself. Okay, how to use this tool uh, and this documentation will be uh, done in the planning stage. Yeah. Okay, this is about configuration management. That is it. I mean, you don't need to know more about it. If you just know these two words, no, that is actually quite enough to identify it. To the exam, yeah. And yeah, one more is this unambiguously, you can find the document. So what is risk actually? So risk is like in future something going wrong. If you see that, that something may go wrong in future because of certain conditions, that is a risk. Okay. Now, if we see it in the form of a definition, then the chance of an event, hazard, threat or situation occurring and resulting in undesirable consequences we don't want that to happen but that is what is happening so like we have a mobile phone and we don't want this to crash but it is crashing that is an undesirable consequence yeah or if we, if we are pressing a button in the mobile phone in on an app and then app is taking a lot of time for launching so this is an undesirable uh, consequence of the performance related of the performance issue okay so this is the risk and if we go with the istqb definition they says that a factor that could result in future negative consequence, usually expressed as impact and likelihood. Okay, so risk is usually defined as impact and likelihood. Uh, risk is actually things going wrong in future. Risk level is defined as likelihood and impact. Okay. Okay. What is the meaning of likelihood? Likelihood means how many times this event can occur, the undesirable event, whatever we are talking about, what is the probability of uh, occurrence of this defect? Impact means once this defect occurs, what is the consequence of that? What is the impact mm -hmm. of that? So two things, okay. how frequently this defect will come and what will be its impact when this defect occurs? So there is a possibility that a defect may occur 10 times, but user will not notice it. So no impact. There is also possibility that the impact, the, the, the only one time it comes, but the user is able to see this and it's mm -hmm. of a high impact. Okay. Okay. For an example. So if we have a car in car, we have sunroof, right? And then in a car, we also have a braking system. Suppose out of 10 times, this sunroof is not opening eight times, but this braking system out of means, uh, 10 times, it is not working one time, which is where you will give more risk level. Be, uh, I see to be 10 by one. 10 by one only, right? Because okay. even one time this brake is not logging, it's a life hazardous yeah. situation. So that's why this is more uh, risky system. So that's how they evaluate the product based on the product they define the risk level there 
Okay. Okay. So there are three process all, always here. The first process is that we have to identify the risk as many risks as possible first. Then we have to do the assessment of those risks. That is called risk assessment. Once you have assessed your risk, all the risk, then you will mitigate them. Means you will try to remove them from your system. So yeah. always these are the three stages and you will learn more about it in the advanced level syllabus. Okay, there mm -hmm. it is mentioned. But here you just need to know what is the risk. Uh, risk is just like uh, the undesirable consequence or the future negative consequence. Risk level is a definition where we maintain this likelihood and impact. Likelihood means how many times this defect will come. And impact means even if, whenever it comes, what is the consequence of it? Okay. So this is, and what was the question in your exam? Uh, yeah, risk level regarding that only, likelihood and impact. Yeah, both. Someone gave me one question. Um, I think it's the same question you might have got. Maybe I will search and give you. So someone okay. gave me this question also. Do you have the candidates who are taking for the second time also in the WhatsApp group? Mm, one lady is there. You can actually ask if someone is taking the exam for the second time. You can ask in the group, not a problem. Okay. Okay. I think there is one lady because she also told me a lot of questions that this was asked previously. This was asked. So yeah, she has also, she's also writing it for the second time. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Now, to understand this project risk and product risk. So again, I will give you an overview so that it will help you to understand and you no need to buy hard. Obviously, you have to go through it once or twice, but you don't have to buy hard them. So you have a project. There is two stages in your project. So here your project starts and here your project ends. Once your project ends, it becomes a product. Right? Before that, right. it is a project only. And after the main release, it becomes a product. Okay. So this yeah. difference is clear, right? What is project and what is product? Now, yeah. when we talk about risk, if you are not able to deliver your project on time, that is a project risk. Mm -hmm. Once you deliver the product, then if testers find some defect or user finds, normally not testers, customer or user, when they find any issue in your product, means you are using a product and you are finding a defect in it. Yeah. That time it is a product risk. Okay. Okay. So if you remember this diagram that until release, what all things you have in your system, which is not allowing you to meet this release time. For an example, the skill set of the tester or developers. If they are not very skillful, then you cannot reach this timeline, right? Right. But once you reach the timeline, once everything is fixed, then once the product is released. But if customer don't see anything, there is no product risk. There was only a project risk, but you have managed it, but there is no risk in the product right now because customer is not finding. But if suppose you have very efficient team, everything is done, but user found some mistake in the product, then there is a product risk, but there was no project risk. Mm -hmm. We're getting the point here, right? That how we are differentiating. So now if we read this statement, then you will see that it's very easy to mark which one is a project risk and product risk. If you are getting confused between any of these points, then let me know and then I will explain you for the project risk. For example, organizational factors. So organizational factors is always here only, organization related factors like the skill, training, staffing shortage, so it has nothing to do with product, right? It is with the organization who is implementing it. They have to take care of these things. The personal issues, if someone is not well for a long time, they are not able to support the team, something like that, the personal issues here. Or the technical expert is not available. So in those cases, you cannot deliver your project on time, right? There is a risk to your project itself. You're getting these points? Three points? Yeah. Yeah. So let me, once we go through it, let me know what, which statement you saw in your exam. You will see that also. Then coming, then comes the technical issues. Technical issues means the requirement is not right. 
obviously it, it may result in a project product is afterwards when you implement it but if the requirement is not correct it will take a lot of time here delays will be here itself okay yes okay and if the requirements are there but you are not able to meet those requirements then also it is a project risk it will delay your project if you are not able to uh, meet uh, if you are not able to fulfill the requirement because based on what you have currently okay or the test environment is not ready if the test environment is not ready you cannot complete your testing right late data conversion late data conversion means late tool support suppose you already have a tool and then you plan that during last time the one more tool will come and with that you can achieve the planning this tool came mm -hmm. but it is not integrated with your tool right now that is what you evaluated at the last moment then it is a project risk only right yes and if your design documents are of poor quality your coding is of poor quality your configuration management is not good all these things are related to your project risk only not product risk mm -hmm. supplier issues like you are working you have given it to the third party now this third party people are not able to deliver you the product so this is also also related to your project risk only and then contractual issues also okay like you made a contract here and then you might not have understood properly here and then you are making some changes in the contracts here okay then also it okay. will result in a big uh, means again discussions it will the discussions will start and all those things will happen mm -hmm. So that is our supplier issues. But now you are getting right. All the things which we are talking right now is in is coming in this category only, not in this category. Right. Yeah. Actually, this concept is is very important. When we read the ISTQB document, this is not clear. They don't mention this. They mention the points, but these things are missing in it, and that's mm -hmm. why it's sometimes tricky. Then other things also political risks. Sometimes we see that in the organization there are some. politics over there so that also results in uh, late delivery uh, developers and uh, testers are failing to improve the practices so whatever they are doing they are doing it in that way only they are not improving training and all those things are not happening sometime we have some improper attitude within the team that's also is a problem yeah actually for me i think the question was uh, a, a manager he is going to work on scenario based and uh, they had given four options out of which the third was all of the above okay so that i had chosen because everything was falling in that project risk only okay okay uh -huh. yeah and uh, the last one is that delay may occur in the delivery so you are not able to deliver your project then this is a delivery related issue then task completion satisfaction of exit criteria you have completed everything but exit criteria is not meeting now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so this thing or in the starting only we have made inaccurate estimations the project was very complicated but we didn't look into that aspect of the project we made very less estimation and now we see that it takes double the time all these things relocation of funds to higher priority projects sometimes we are working on this project then they see that a very very important project is there so they move the resource from here and then here then this project yeah. will for at that time so that is also one issue and sometimes the late changes may result in subsequent rework so you are towards the release and here you see that lot of rework lot of requirements are changed now mm -hmm. so this is also a project related risk okay. okay so this is clear i guess then the product related risk is like when you are you have a product which is outside now you found a risk but you see that now you cannot do anything here to cover this risk right that one so software might not perform its intended function so software is not able to provide to do its intended function when it is used by the user customer or stakeholder product risk yeah. a system architecture may not adequately support some non functional requirement for example the mobile phone is the result and the response time is now not good mm -hmm. now they have reported it here but in the architecture now they don't do not have any scope the hardware and all those stuff they have used the mechanism they have used 
they say that this response time we cannot achieve okay this is a risk to your product only though it is at this level but you are not able to handle it right yeah so and especially if you hear this non functional requirement then it means how the system should work and it always comes at the end right we have seen in the second number chapter also yes so that's why and a particular computation may be performed incorrectly you know so here uh, just as an example of if you just take a small example calculator it has to perform the calculation it is not able to perform that then it's gone right or if you have a thermometer and if it is not able to display that correct uh, uh, degree here that that's mm -hmm. the point yeah then user experience feedback so anyway if from user you are getting a feedback then obviously it is about the product they are not going to comment on how you have worked here right they have only product so they will only comment on the product here and the response time we already covered with the non performance thing so if the in response time is not adequate then that also is a potential product risk okay okay so this is all about the project risk and product risk uh and then why do we uh, do this risk analysis on the product we do a risk analysis right in the planning stage we we get the result from the risk so that uh, you remember it in the during the planning we make the risk analysis also yeah. so that we know what, which type of test technique we need here we should implement which type of test technique and to prioritize the test this also i gave you an example if more risky the system we will give them priority one so that throughout the cycle they are always taken care yeah and again to determine the extent of which uh, extent of testing to be carried out so how much testing we should carry out uh, that also is defined by the risk level and then determine whether any non testing activities could be employed to reduce risk for example we can say that though we are doing manual testing but for defect management we will go for the tool so this is a supporting activity for logging the defect okay so this way we can have a good tracking and we can reduce the risk so this is a non testing activity but it is helping us in reducing the risk yeah or providing trainings to the inexperienced designer or inexperienced tester this is also not directly related to testing but it can help you in reducing the risk okay and also it helps us to know where to start and when to test more so i told you know like you will have lots of features so from which feature you will start testing so if this is a risky feature then you will start testing with this one yeah right so this is how it is maybe you can also go through the points once but can you again explain like uh, non testing activities could be employed to reduce risk yes so here for example you are performing all manual testing okay yeah then what you see is that uh, there are a lot of defects open if you are if you are also maintaining defects manually then it is little mm -hmm. bit difficult so what you do is you tell that this defects i want to manage through tool so okay. your testing is you are doing manual testing but for defect management for tracking system you have a defect management system here so this is a non testing activity but with this you are also able to reduce the risk because you are able to track properly okay okay this is one point second part of it is that suppose you have some inexperienced tester in your team so you are providing training to them so the providing training is not a testing activity right but if they are trained properly then they will test properly and they will reduce the risk so in that yes. so this is the point that even if we, we can do some non testing activities to reduce the risk okay by using some tools by providing training to the people like that okay and then let's move to the next point Mm -hmm. so what is the disciplined approach uh, i already told you this also or uh, we have already covered that that 
first is the identification stage then yes, is sir. the assessment stage and then is the mitigation yes. stage that is what they are doing here and when you are identifying now you first identify the risk and in the identification stage you identify the risk in the assessment stage you identify the risk levels and in the uh, this one uh, mitigation stage you find the solutions for it okay that's what it is mentioned assess what can go wrong this is one thing then we have to define the risk levels based on the likelihood and impact mm -hmm. and then implement actions to deal with those risks which is the last stage okay okay and reassess on a regular basis so this is not a one time activity so after each release every time we have to look into it fine so now we go to the last topic of chapter number 5 that is defect management try to avoid reporting false positive as defects false positive as defect means uh, means something is something is correct in the software mm -hmm. but we are marking it as fail because okay. it failed in our testing maybe it could be due to the test environment related issue or maybe the test case is not written properly possible but we should avoid such type of issue putting into so the if it is a false then it should be a false in the software okay that's what we they are trying to say here and where in all you can raise the defect any stage you are in the development stage you can raise the defect you are in the review stage you can raise the defect testing stage you can raise the defect or if you are doing use case testing or by user also they can also raise the defect in use case testing also you can raise the defect so any stage you are in you can perform either a static testing or you can perform a dynamic testing but in both cases you will find the defects and then you should raise the defect in the defect management tool yeah and against what we can raise the defect anything we can raise the defect against code against the system again the document system means what suppose you have a test environment right yeah. while testing you came to know that certain things is not working fine then you can raise a defect for that and mm -hmm. assign it to the corresponding person and then he will fix the test environment okay so that's why code system or any document which you are reviewing you can raise a defect for it clear right this all the points here yeah. and what are the possible causes of defect obviously if the defect is there in the software fine test faults the test case itself is faulty properly not the expected result is not correct there environment is faulty or the requirement which you are referring the requirement is faulty or the test data which you are using that is faulty okay okay so these are some of the possible causes of defect so uh, don't think that if environment is faulty then that is not a cause of uh, defect and we should not log that in defect management we can i gave you the example previously and then okay. test fault even your test case is failing suppose five ten test cases are failing you can create one defect report and you can mention that these test cases are failing and we need to fix in next release so that it can be tracked yeah Okay, and then the specification and, and all these things here. Yeah. What is the objective of uh, reporting these defects? Obviously, we don't want to criticize someone, but we want to give feedback to the developers and the other parties that something is wrong. Then identity uh, enable identification, isolation, and correction of defects. So we have seen no previously testing and debugging. So testing, we find that defect. given to the de development team then they do the debugging in the debugging what they do is first uh, they uh, analyze. analyze the defect then they find the root cause and they fix it these things and then it again goes to the testing for retesting yeah. so that is what they are talking here so that is the objective that we want to achieve this that it is fixed again okay and again it provides the test leader to see what is the quality of our system 
the progress of the testing also both the things okay and it also provides an idea for the test process improvement so over a period of time we will have lot of defects and obviously we mention the reason and everything then what they will do is they will put one filters here and in the filter they will see that because of what reason we got lot of defects out of this suppose there are five common reasons for getting this defect root cause five root causes are common then they will try to target these root cause so that we will not get this in future okay okay Maybe you want to read it once before we go to the next one. I think last slide after this. Yeah, these points are straightforward. Mm -hmm. We can relate that these are with respect to test and defect management. Okay. Yeah, from your uh, only record question. Yes. Sometimes they give the scenario also and then they ask you what all things are important. Yeah, scenario based. They said like what was missing and they gave the options. Okay. So in the scenario based question, then you have to understand that <clears throat> what are the important information which is needed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for example, here they have told that so some of these things should be missing there. For example, date and time must be there when this was tested what was the time day and time who is the issuing organization means you have to first know these things then only in the when you read the scenario you have to include these points and then finally you know the answer here that what was missing okay yeah. first of all you should know that what all things should be included so these are the things should be included there but out of these things what was applicable to your scenario and uh, you missed it that's what we need to know here okay so date and time should be there issuing organization so because when two organization or three organizations are working on then the oem want to know that who has created this defect so that in future they can uh, uh, get the uh, data about it so issuing organization whoever has raised whoever has found this defect their name test item and environment Okay, which version of the software you were testing and what was your environment? In which environment you were testing? Okay, like the version number of your tool, which, whichever tool you are using or the software you are using, the version number of it. Life cycle process in which it was observed. So in the, like which stage you have observed it. For example, during the component testing, you got this or during the System testing you got is when you got, in which life cycle process you got these things. Okay. Okay. Description to enable reproduction and resolution. So, <clears throat> okay. So, descriptions of description to enable the reproduction. So, here means the test steps should be mentioned, the description, how the other person is going to reproduce your issue. So sometimes we can provide the logs, we can provide the dumps, sometimes the screenshots, what we did. So all these things, that is the description. Sometimes even the videos itself, we will put, this is how we are testing it. Okay. Okay. So degrees of impact on stakeholders interest. So. Uh, next thing is impact and severity and priority all three things so what is the impact on customer how much is the severity and how much is what is the priority of this uh, defect so these also we have to mention okay other one is the status of the incident means defect status we have to put whether it is in open state deferred state it is fixed it is awaiting for retesting or it is fixed and closed one of the state should be mentioned there then conclusion and recommendations and approvals. So whoever approval is required, their names also should be mentioned there. Global issues, if it is really, if this defect is creating any global issues, then that also we have to mention as a note that because of this issue, this will, this is what is the impact. Change history. So whichever defect 
testing tool you have it should con it should also have a defect uh, sorry it should have a change history so if someone is changing something it should log here there itself okay and then some references like test case id or the step number where the problem happened all these things okay so now you have to see a scenario whichever you got that in that scenario what was the important point out of these things actually this was not available description to enable reproduction and uh, <coughs> resolution mm -hmm. this was a missing point okay yeah mm -hmm. okay so yeah so once we know these things then only we know that what is actually missing in your report right I think th that was the last topic. Again, we can just take a break and uh, what's the time now? I don't know. It's, so around 5.15 uh, until 5.15 or 5.30 it is fine for you if we continue until 5.30. Until 5.30. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. And so we will start from uh, some uh, 4, 4 30 somewhere around at that time. And then this takes only one hour of our time. So I also need yeah, from, to... From this chapter, we get two questions, right? We only get two questions and uh, I will tell you where and all we get the questions. Mostly you might have got from there only. One is from the pilot project maybe. You might have got. Yeah, I got it from pilot project only. Okay, so that is one very important thing which I know that people get questions from there. And uh, one more topic we need to see. From here and there you can get one more question. Okay. Okay. Did you get anything from proof of concept? No. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is one topic inside the pilot project. This is one more topic, proof of concept. Maybe this time you may get. I'm not sure this time you will get it or not, but uh, this is also a very important topic in this proof of concept. Okay. Fine, then let's take a 15 minute break. I also take a break and then we continue with chapter number six. Uh, we will Fine. do one more thing. Uh, we will try to solve the questions of uh, chapter number five as well as six, chapter number six together. Okay. Hmm? That also we will do at the end then. Okay, yeah. fine then. And Kiran, yeah, see you. Thank you.
Yes, I am also back now. Yes, sir. Hi. Okay, you are also there. Then let's start with this uh, type of test tools and uh, let's see how it goes. Okay, so maybe just overview if I have to give then, uh, and then we go to the chapter. So here also we will divide the chapter into some parts and then uh, the first part we will, I mean, obviously we will see this, what is the benefits of using tools? What is the risk of using tool? And what is the objective of using tool? This is one part of it. Okay, and uh, this is, oh, yeah, maybe I can write down here only the benefit, risk, and the objective, three things. And then we will get into like, which all tools are used by the testers and which are the tools used by the developers. Did you get any question on tools? Like which of the, these tools are used by testers or developers? Not yet. No, the, all the questions were based on the third topic, like uh, pilot project and POC. Okay. These two questions had come. Okay. And then obviously you will have the pilot project and the success of tool in your, in your organization. Uh, this is the one more part. So this time maybe we can expect some question from here that which tool is used by whom. Okay. okay. Also some parts here. So let's start with it. Actually in the, throughout the chapter, we have used lots of example and all this stuff. So most of these tools are already covered actually here. We just, we'll just go through them. So what is the purpose of using tool? First of all, obviously we want to make our we want to improve the efficiency of our system. So previously, if it was taking two weeks of our testing time, we want to reduce it. That's why we are going for tool. We want to make it one week or maybe less than that because we are using it night runs and all those stuff. So this is one thing that we want to improve the efficiency. How by automating some of the repetitive tasks or the manual activities. If we have some manual activities, we can automate them. Or if there is something repeating, which, which we are repeating uh, from release to release, then we can also automate them. And with that, we can improve the efficiency. And then automating activities that require significant resource. So we also have to identify that which part of the testing requires a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. So we can start with that. For example, static testing. If there is a big document, okay, and in this document, someone asks us to please find all the spelling mistakes. It's really tedious to do that instead of having a tool and then passing this document to a tool and that tool will give us all the results. Okay, these are the words where we went wrong. So here the effort is too big. Whereas if you have tool, then it is it will be reduced. So yeah. that thing. And there are things which you cannot do it manually. For example, if you want to test something in microseconds, the response time, you cannot do it manually. That time you should have a tools like performance testing tool, or the load testing tool, uh, tool also by like uh, generating lots of users. You cannot do it by yourself, right? You, how many user IDs and passwords you will create? But if you have a tool, the tool can create and then try to log in with a lot of user IDs. That's one thing. Yeah. And then increasing the reliability of the testing. For an example, if you prepare a manual report, there is a lot of time that the date may be wrong, the version may be wrong, something will be there, some of the other issue will be there in your manual report. But if a tool is generating that report, then everything will be in order and everything will be right in that. Mm -hmm. That way we are increasing the reliability. Also the test cases. So if you are doing manual testing, one time you may do it in one way, another time you may do it in another way. Okay, but if in a two, if you use a test case, sorry, uh, if you use a tool, then uh, you will have a script which will be in one way only. Every time it will give you a same result. Okay, so these are some of the purpose that uh, because of which we want to use the tool. One is that obviously to increase the efficiency. Then automating the activities that require significant resource or automating activities which we cannot perform manually and increasing the reliability of the system. Yeah. And when we go for the classification, so we classify tools based on their usage. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So based on how, in which level we are going to use uh, or where this tool will be used, based on that, we define its name. For an example, if you are using it for the management purpose, then it is called as a management tool. When you use it for static testing, then it is called as a static testing tool. If you use any tool for the design activities or implementation activities, then they are referred as design related tools. Or if you are only using a tool for execution, then it is a execution tool. Or if you use some tool for showing the matrices or all these things like pie charts or graph in the form of a graphical things, then that we refer to it as a monitoring tool. And apart from these tools, we sometimes need some small, small tools uh, in our organization. Okay. Okay. So this is all we will now anyways, we will go in detail about these two. This was just the overview. Okay. So tools are classified according to the testing activities they support. Okay. Yeah. So now let's go ahead. Now, when we see here, uh, that uh, means what they're trying to show here is, uh, usually you will have one tool, test management tool, and this is ALM means application lifecycle management. This tool will have everything in it. Even if it does not have that, even if we see that some of the tools are not available and if we purchase them, then we, we want to integrate those tools with our tool. The main tool which we have, we want to integrate everything with the same tool itself. So we want everything in one place. Okay, for my, for example, the, the management tool will also have access to the defect tracking system, the requirement management tool, the configuration management tool, and the continuous integration tool also. Okay. okay means we should have interface between all the tools from our main tool. So the requirement management tool for what purpose it is used? Obviously to store the requirement. And sometime when we have the requirement, we will also have the attributes for it, right? That if we have lots of requirement, then we will say that first priority, this is priority one, this is priority two, this is priority one, this is priority three, this is priority one, maybe like that. So you will have different, different attributes. You can have also test levels that this will be tested at the component level. This could be tested at the software level. This is also software level, component level, component level, something like that. So along with the requirement, you will also have the attributes, like who is the owner for this requirement? What is the source of this requirement? All these things. Okay. Then the management tool also helps you to enable the traceability because you have everything in this tool, right? So you can provide the traceability between anything between test cases to requirement, to report, to everything you will, you can do the traceability here. This, this is clear? Yeah. So that's why it will help. It may help with identifying inconsistent or missing requirement. So which tool help you to identify inconsistent and missing requirement? It is the requirement management tool. Okay. Because here you are able to do the traceability. That is the reason. Okay, one of the I means uh, also if you get question from these topics, then this could be one question. Okay. Yeah. Defect management tool. Just now we covered that uh, it is used to store the store and manage the defects, right? The failures and defects, change requests, uh, change request in the sense if. Uh, from customer if something comes newly right that we we also store it in a defect management tool so that we can track it we will provide our unique id uh, and then it should be in, it will be in open state initially and then finally it should go to the closed state that it is implemented in the software and also tested okay perceived problems and anomalies so to also see that uh, what is the state of your problem and uh, like getting the overall detail about your problems this is what for this is the purpose for which defect management tool is used defect manage and also management of the defect cycle so we have already seen right that is it is it in open state or it is in assigned state it is in fixed state it is in closed state so also maintaining this defect life cycle any doubts here no 
okay this is quite easy one continuous integration tool you are anyways working in this uh, environment only you know you are aware of this continuous integration tool or yeah you are already then i will not give example here of what is continuous integration tool so normally it is used for the build activities so after everyone all the developers put their code here and then finally the build will be generated automatically and then if the build fails then the the people get emails about it that the build is failed or otherwise this build will be used for the testing directly okay right. so this is how it is mm -hmm. so easier for developer to integrate changes because daily this integration is happening if something goes wrong they can very easily find out where things went wrong and easier for user to get fresh build so suppose the build is not working here in that case they can take the build from this place okay so that's why you can easily get the builds also continuous integration means that integrated code into a shared repository several times a day several times a day or every day i mean anything okay so this is the point here each is yeah, each check is verified by a build okay so whatever is needed then the it will be verified in a build itself and allow early detection defect detection so suppose you had a build here which is working fine then you wanted to make a build here and it is failed then you know that whatever changes we have done from here to here has some issues so early detection it will help us in uh, detecting the things early configuration management we know we have also covered this in chapter number 5 that it is used to store the version of the software and version of the test wares mm. and uh, particularly useful when configuring different environment okay means if you are working in different different environment or different different releases and this is the time when you need this configuration management tool and it is not strictly a test tool this also we need to uh, take care okay so these are the few things here and then let's move further again in chapter number 3 we have studied everything in detail about the review ah. tool, right these yeah. tools are used to store the informations and um, uh, also store and communicate the review comments so if uh, any reviewer gives a review comment then we can store that we can report the defects we can report on effort spent so for reviewing one document how much effort we have spent that also we can document here okay and sometimes this tool also helps us in doing the online review like in case of walk through so the person will be sharing in the screen that all these things and then two people also will be at their own system and then they will be reviewing it okay so this is how it is so this is what geographically dis uh, dispersed team if people are in different different uh, places then they can join the online review yes so this is also this is just about the review related tools but only thing is like sometime uh, like if you see like uh, the review tool will uh, uh, will uh, record the effort spent so you should know mm -hmm. that yes this is part of your review tool you should not see that this is a random statement we do not uh, record the effort it should not be like that okay and uh, obviously the static analysis tool we have previously also given example of a function so if you have lots of function in your system and the standard says that you cannot have more than uh, 10 defects in your system then finding that is very difficult unless you have a tool with you static analysis tool so the enforce enforcement uh, enforcement of coding standards so like variable should be of 32 uh, letters only so we it is very difficult to find but the tool can do that for us then analyzing of structure and dependencies okay so which which module is dependent on which other module and how much is it very complicatedly de dependent on that so that also can this tool can provide us and i also gave you an example i guess that compiler is also an static analysis tool 
Yeah. And act as a static analysis tool. So sometimes you also get this question. Yeah. Then there are tools which help you in uh, uh, in the test design. I gave you also this example like the model based design. So they will tell you that uh, you have these uh, some of these uh, things like some representations you have. You can use this representation and then you can draw the design. Okay. Sometimes you also have a tool which in which in the right hand side or left hand side, you will have some libraries. Okay, and then you just drag and drop these libraries and make your test case like first one, then last one based on your test case, you drag and drop the libraries here. And then finally, with all drag and drop your test case will be prepared. So this is a test design tool. Okay. Uh, like requirement based or GUI based. This is a GUI based where you, you in a graphical user interface, you try to draw the diagrams. Okay. Other one is the data preparation tool. What data preparation tool is the uh, do is that in the execution time, right? In the execution time, you can have some, for an example, you can have an Excel sheet, which contains the data. This Excel sheet, you will feed it into the execution tool to take the test data. Okay. It will automatically extract. This is one way where when you store the data, there is other way that you are taking the live data itself, but you cannot use the live data as it is because it's a, it's a matter of privacy. So what will happen is that it will take the live data from the server, but then it will do some masking on it. For example, if it is like Ajit, it will be, so they don't want to make my name like this. So they can make it X, Y, T, something like that. So they will mask it somehow, or they will make it like X, zero, Y, T, something like that. So they will change it completely, but they are not preparing the data. They just get the data and this tool will do that masking for us. And then it will be given as a test data. Then this test data will be fed to the execution tool. Okay. Okay. So two ways, one is you, it's yourself have a data and otherwise you can also get it from the live data for load generation and all. Okay. So this is all about the test design tool and test data preparation tool usually help always helpful in testing environment. Okay. Model based testing. I already told you what is the model based testing uh, the diagram with the diagram. This is what data and control flow sometime in the form of decision table. Also decision table is also uh, also a type of model only that based on certain combination, what output we are going to get. Okay. Okay. And then you have, this is acceptance test driven development. I think you are aware of this, right? Acceptance test driven development. Uh, it is done by the uh, users at the end. No, and no, it, it is also one more thing here is that in the sprints, right? Suppose you have two sprints. So starting okay. of the sprint, you will have user stories, right? Okay. This user story will have the acceptance criteria. No? The acceptance uh, criteria. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware of this concept. Okay. Okay, so normally what will happen is uh, that in the requirement itself, they will have the requirement in the user story form. And in the end, they will mention that when this requirements, we can say is fulfilled, they will mention that acceptance criteria. Okay. So the developers will also develop based on seeing that this acceptance criteria is fulfilled or not. And testers will also see that once they test this acceptance criteria is filled or not. Mm -hmm. so this is acceptance test driven development. So first the acceptance criteria is mentioned based on that the development activity happens. Okay. Behavior driven development is anyway same. The requirement is written where that behavior is mentioned. So based on that, you do the development. Right. And test driven okay. development, we already saw an example, right? Where the test case was written first, then it was automated. Then the coding was done. To, when we were doing the coding, that time the requirement was also into considered. Two things was considering and then we were executing it. Yeah. So this is the test driven development. Then acceptance test driven tools uses tests based on the customer or business requirement. Okay, this is acceptance test driven based on customer or business requirements. And BDD means behavior driven development. So it is dependent on behavior of the system. Okay. Test driven development is first testing is done, then the development starts. Yeah. So this is very normal concept, but 
don't see any question in the in the advanced level syllabus again these things are explained in much detail okay so it's interesting execution tool again what it will do it will do it will record the test and expected results right so that we can compare execute yeah. the test automatically you just have to load the test cases it will run then it will compare the actual result with the expected result if both are same passed if both are different failed and also provides the test logs okay and yeah i have seen one term comparator p o r comparator so comparator is also like a kind of a logic where it will compare the actual result with the expected result so this comparator is present in the execution tool okay yeah this we have okay. to remember then test harness and the unit test framework tool these are the tools which helps you in uh, during the component testing we have anyway seen no this drivers and stubs yes so that's why it's component testing or something component integration testing so it is also helpful to simulate the environment so we don't have drivers and stubs so we can simulate that and this is what anyway stub and driver is also mentioned here right so stub and drivers are developed here so this is the framework okay so is this point clear here the execution tool and these things yeah Okay. Now what we have is now the coverage measurement tools. So like statement coverage, decision coverage. We have seen you now how much percentage of the statement is covered, how much percentage of the decision is covered. Mm -hmm. So there are tools for measuring this. I'm not sure if you have heard of a tool RT RT. Okay, no. so this is one tool. There is one more tool, Bullseye. There are many other tools which give you this in the percentage format. Okay. We already covered that performance related tools, so load testing or stress testing, volume testing, performance testing. What is the response time, right? Mm. And these things for these things also we have a tool here. So nothing much here also. yeah don't get confused again between two two topics one is dynamic analysis tool and dynamic testing okay yeah okay never get confused between these two because this is also one point dynamic analysis tools are used by the developers and dynamic testing is done by the testers whose use difference here okay okay so norm this dynamic analysis means uh, when your software is running like run time measurement okay this is done by the dynamic analysis tool and memory leaks memory leaks means for i also give you an example for example you are using pointer and then you forget to release this address at the end then this may result in a memory leak after some time or you are using some variables and then you just leave it you are you are not releasing this variables at the end of your execution then after some time your memory will start filling and maybe after 3 hours or 4 hours the system will crash because of memory leak or buffer overflow okay then time dependency so if anything related to time dependencies are there there also you will have a problem because your response time is less because the memory is less memory is available to you okay for example a mobile phone itself when we feel lot of data into it then it becomes slow right so that's how it is and then the dynamic analysis tool also like cpu utilization disk utilization network utilization how much bandwidth of the network it is using so you have this task manager right that is also like a dynamic analysis tool only task manager of your cpu okay that gives you the cpu how much You have, yeah yeah what performance your system is giving yeah and this actually warns you of the possible service problems which will come in future 
okay mm -hmm. like if you have not fill this variable as I told after some time slowly if you are using your system you will see that it will become slow for an example the office laptops when we are not closing it and using it continuously from week after week it starts becoming slow then when we restart then it starts working properly yeah. right so that's what the, the bonds of a possible service problem so slowly it will become slow and then it will give you just like a warning for you that it is going to be more slower in future if you don't take any action Okay. Okay. Then there are some specialized testing tools. Means uh, I will not go through this point, but it's like a very small, small script. Sometimes we need in your pro our project, right? That very we don't need a very big tool from some company. Some small, small scripts we will do for our own uh, needs to, to fulfill our needs. Those things will come under the specified testing tool. For example, you have an Excel sheet. Now you want this Excel sheet data in the form of a list. So you will develop one small script so that this Excel data will be converted to one list and this list will be given to your code. Mm -hmm. Like something like this, some small, small uh, scripting you will do that is that will come under the specialized testing uh, tool. Okay. So this is all about the tools. And then when you go for security testing tool, obviously it is going to check the security like confidentiality, integrity, authentications. Okay. Identifying this one is very important. I mean, it's very simple that security characteristics will be tested by security tool only. And what are the security yeah. characteristics? Confidentiality, integrity, and authentication or authorization. Okay. okay. It's a simple topic only. And there are other tools which we have again seen in chapter number two, it, two itself, the usability tool to check the user friendliness. I also told you that accessibility tools means like for the specially enabled people, like yeah. we need more voice or we need voice recognition or the buttons or, or such things. So for the disabilities, okay. Then localization testing. Localization testing means uh, like, uh, when we re release a product in in USA or when in India or in China, there will be some cul cultural factors will be there. So based on that, certain features will be enabled, certain features we will not enable for them. Right. So that testing we need to do to see that uh, in when it is in, released in India, these features should not be visible here. Okay. And portability testing means like you have developed one software. And you want it to be running mobile one, mobile two, mobile three models, all three models. So you want to see that it is working fine or not in all the models. That is the uh, support, multiple platform support. Or you develop an application. You want to run it in different, different websites, website one, website two, web website three, all websites you want that to run properly. So this is also an example of portability testing. Okay. So that's all about the tools and this is one page which is summarizing the complete tools okay so okay. once you have a slide with you maybe instead of going through all that you can just read this one this one and this one so these okay. are the tools which are used by the developers the remaining all tools are used by the testers okay so like static analysis tool dynamic analysis tool not dynamic testing again i'm repeating it's dynamic mm -hmm. analysis tool. So static analysis tool, dynamic analysis tool, two tools used by the developers. Then uh, test hardness, you can always relate it to component testing and component integration testing. So that's why by developers. Coverage measurement, you can relate it with, relate it with statement coverage, decision coverage. That's why developer. Mm -hmm. Test driven development is also be covered in the component testing, if you remember mm -hmm. concept. So that's why. And anyways, we know continuous integration is done by the developer. Okay. So that's why these tools go there. Now it's a very simple topic, the benefits of the tools. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we, in the starting, we saw no objectives. So that is also the benefit. If we achieve that objective, that becomes a benefit for us. Like we want to avoid the repetitive task like manually running the test cases again and again, uh, manually, so instead of manually, you can do it, you go for automation. 
text greater consistency is and repeatability right this i gave you an example like your reports will be intact always it will come in same yeah. format your test cases result uh, means the way test case is performed that is also consistent the time suppose you are doing it manually so first time you may take 10 minute next time you may take 15 minutes based on multiple factors or next time you can take 5 minute also for the same test case but if you are using a tool if it is taking 2 seconds every time it will take 2 seconds only so consistency is and you can also do a objective assessment because normally when you get the result right it will be in the form of a graph or some table like that especially for the statement coverage and decision coverage if you do not have the graphs it is very difficult to identify which feature how much percentage we have covered right so it will help you in objective assessments you got this point right yeah and then ease of access to information about testing if you have done everything manually it is very difficult for you to remember everything right if it is everything manual but if it is in tool you can put some filters to this tool and you can get the data out of it very easily okay any type of data but only if you have a tool right so these are some of the benefits any doubts on the benefits no so we go to the risks then so uh, one of the risk is that unrealistic expectation now the manager will think that everything is automated so just give me the report tomorrow and day after tomorrow because once you click anyway everything will work fine but that's not the case there are a lot of scenarios where the test case will fail we have to work on it analyze the failed reports many things are there so the develop, the manager may get a unrealistic expectation okay underestimating initial introduction cost time and effort so when you introduce the tool for a very first time within your organization you may forget that if you have 100 people the 100 people may need training so that is a effort that is a cost there is a time involved in it so we may underestimate that while purchasing the tool okay other thing is that we may think now if we purchase tool from release one itself we will get the benefit but it is not the case you have to automate test cases once you risk once you are in some like release four once you have the good amount of automation then only you will start getting the benefits okay okay so this is what i was telling underestimating the time and effort needed to achieve the benefit so you may think from first release itself you will start getting the benefit there is a possibility people are learning this that and then after a lot of release you will get the benefits out of it mm. and sometimes over reliance on the tool sometimes it is very easy to run uh, test something manually but when we want to automate it it is very difficult but we think that since we have automation tool let's automate that okay so this is also uh, a risk Um, there are some more risks. Are you uh, means uh, tired, or maybe we can take some break and then we can continue. Also, we have on uh, somewhere around seven more slides. Okay, then we can take break. Okay, time. yeah, then we can take a break of how much time? It is five three five fifteen. Okay. Okay. Then, yeah.
Hi, Kiran, are you there? <laughs> no. Yes, I did. Okay, we will continue or what to do? Six more slides are there. So, uh, yeah, let's finish it. Stop, right? Instead of keeping it for next time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then uh, there are some more risks here, like neglecting the version control. Neglecting the version control means like I also gave you like uh, this, suppose this is a testing one and testing two. For testing one, you have, first you have developed the test wares. So normally what happens uh, when, we, when we see that, okay, we again get a software here. Na? That time we see that, okay, there is no uh, uh, big change. Then what we do is in this only we do some slight changes. Then we take it here. Because in the automation, because in the development team, they have a complete structure in the uh, this one uh, in the configuration management. But we don't have this structure, and no one no one also looks into it. So what we do is whatever test case we have, we are just modifying it. But if you are not doing a version control of it, then it is very difficult to retrieve the data back. Okay, if you are also not storing it and not following the process properly. So that is what is here. That from in the testing team, it is a potential risk that we may neglect the versions. Especially yeah. versions of the software. Again, neglecting the interportability issue between the tools itself. So mm -hmm. one thing is like I also gave this example that you already have your own tool, and then you get the tool from the vendors. Then you also have to see that this tool and this tool should have some interface between them, so that they can exchange the data. Yeah. Cool. And then risk from the vendor. So you are taking the tool from the vendor, but what if the vendor itself goes out of business or mm. after two years, they tell that this tool, we are not supporting anymore. We are retiring this tool. Okay. Then, or this vendor, you had everything going good with this vendor, but this vendor decided to sell their tool to the other vendors. Okay. Or other possibility is that the poor support from the vendors. So when you ask the question, it takes a lot of time, two to three days for them to respond. Mm. Okay. And infrequent upgrades. So multiple times they give the upgrades and then this makes your system unstable. Okay. And slow tool defect fixing. So if there is any defect in the tool, they are not able to fix it quickly. So these are also some of the risks with the tools when we purchase. Yeah. And if you are using a tool from open source, then there is a risk that anytime this open source project may suspend. Right. Then you may not get the support from them. And there are also very uh, many unforeseen uh, things like inability to support a new platform. Suppose uh, you are using one hardware and this tool was able to support that. But in future, this hardware is upgraded. Now this tool is not able to support this upgraded hardware. Yeah. So this we cannot know. Sometimes this is unforeseen uh, problems also happens. But if you are doing manual testing, then anyway, you can update it. But the tool, if it is not, then you have to purchase a new tool or something. You have to find a workaround. Yeah. Okay. So these are some of the risk, risks. And uh, I think once you read the statements, anyway, you will come to know what is the risk and what is the benefits, right? The difference between that is not that yes. difficult. And uh, sometimes we have to take special consideration for some type of tools. For example, if you are purchasing a test execution tool, then you need to see that you, you need to know that the scripting may require considerable amount of effort. Can you, uh, so you, you should know that otherwise, uh, as I told you, you may think that in the release one itself, everything will be solved, but it's not the case because it's taking a lot of time for scripting, right? So uh, from release to release, the number of test cases will increase. So this we have yeah. to consider. And we also should know that the scripting requires an expert. So if right now, if the team is doing manual testing and if you expect the tool will come and then they will start automation, it will take time for the team also, right? Yes. Because they need the expertise here. 
and this is the point which I was explaining from long time that capturing may not scale up to large volumes. From starting itself, you are not going to have thousand scripts. It will start with ten scripts, twenty scripts like that. Over a period of time, you will have lots of scripts with you. Yeah. So script uh, the captured scripts are linear and can be unstable. So when uh, do, before the release it might be working but something went wrong and then now the script is not working anymore then you have to debug and fix it and then you have to again run it yeah okay. that's also a very common issue when we go for automation expected results have to be stored either way okay so whatever um, uh, like you are expecting right that once the script is running you're expecting some output from the software. So that output you want to compare with the expected result. So this expected result, there should be a place to store the expected result in your execution tool. Okay. okay. So yeah, this is, uh, these, are, these are the things which you need to consider, but you can see that all these things are related to execution only that uh, the scripting, if you want then, for execution only. Okay, and then like scripts becomes unstable during execution only, they will become unstable or we have to store the expected result because the execution tool will do the comparison between uh, expected result and the major result. Yeah. Then there are two concepts. Okay. So we have a keyword driven approach. Are you aware what is the meaning of keyword driven and what is the meaning of data driven already? Uh, data driven in Excel sheet, we will give uh, a yeah. number of combinations and our script is going to pick those combinations. The a single script is going to run with different, different combination of data. Okay. And in keyword driven, we define a, a variable which will pick the data for running that script. Yes, That's like that. yes. Okay. If you just take an example. For example, you have a test case where you have to use the user ID and password, two steps. But suppose you write a test case now where you write, write uh, uh, like uh, enter user ID, then password, then check something, 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 then again enter user ID and password, then come out of it, then again enter user ID and password. So these two lines are every time repeating, right? Instead of these yeah. two, we can just use a word login. Mm. And back end of it will be the code which will be doing user ID and password in, in it. So then you will have only one line here, then one line here, one line here, and like this. So it, that way your test case will reduce. Or sometimes we give a word like libraries. Mm -hmm. We create that libraries. These libraries are also like a keywords only. Okay. Is it clear? Yeah. So keywords are also known as action words because once you log in means it will do the action right of login. So that's why these yes. are also action words. So a keyword will contain some action words within them. Each keyword. Okay. Hmm. Model based testing we already covered uh, two times we have covered and also the test management tool. So test management tool, we saw the diagram, right? Where test management tool was there and there were a lot of tools and I told that we need to have an interface between them. Yeah, yeah. So that is what they're telling. These are also some special considerations which we need to consider. Nothing much from here. But yeah, from here we can get, we can expect some concept, yeah. The main consideration of the tool selection. So when you are selecting a tool, what all things you should consider? So this is also one of the important topic from the exam point of view. And here okay. we have a concept called proof of concept. Mm -hmm. What that means I will tell you, but I have seen uh, questions on this topic. So when you are purchasing a tool, you should also see that how mature is your organization? What is the strength of your organization? What is the weakness of your organization? Suppose you are working on a working with a team where no one knows any scripting language. And you purchase a tool where we need Java or Python, something like that. Then it's going to take a lot of time, right? So you need yeah. to, what is the strength of your team? What is the weakness? Weakness means, again, this is one weakness. Other weakness is like, in which area we are doing lots, we are spending lots of effort. So then we can target that area and for that area, we will purchase the tool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is, what is the meaning here? That assessment of 
organizational maturity strength and weaknesses again next one is also same that like identification of opportunities of test process improvement using tools so using tools which all area of our test process we can improve for example defect logging if it is done manually then we can introduce a tool so that this is done automatically and like likewise then evaluation against clear requirement and objective criteria so we must know what is our requirement what is our objective based on that we should consider the tool okay we also have yeah. to evaluate the vendors i mean we saw no different different factor how big is the vendor yes. whether they will go bankrupt or something like that we have to evaluate that also then free trial periods okay so once we purchase the tool until when we can use it as a free obviously not for commercial purpose but for training purpose mm -hmm. okay again evaluation of the supplier the vendor supplier it's all same identification of test team training needs so how much we need to train our team members so we should select a tool where the training less training is required Yeah. we also have to see that the licensing mechanism like it's one time purchase every month we have to uh, renew the license these things also we have to consider or it is a free source okay estimation of cost and benefit cost and benefit ratio that means once you introduce a tool into your organization after how much time we will start getting benefit out of it mm -hmm. because until we are descriptive until we are developing the script all we are putting the effort money and time but there will be a time when we don't need all these people maybe one person will be here in this team and all others will move to the other team and only one person will be managing after some time for a longer duration okay so that's how uh, cost uh, or benefit ratio now we come to the next topic that is proof of concept very important in one of the exam they were they have asked like what do you mean by proof of concept mm -hmm. okay proof of concept means suppose you have already an process okay now you have a tool you want to introduce this tool in your organization you have to do a proof of concept how easily you can integrate this tool into your system into your process that is a proof of concept or how much change you have to do in your system if you want to introduce this tool into your system is it yeah, clear? yeah? so this is this concept is called proof of concept how what you need to do so that the tool can fit into your process so like this yeah, three question have come for me proof of concept definition okay, okay. so were you aware of that or this question went wrong you had one question right one question wrong right yeah it, i think this was right the other one it was with the pilot project that went wrong okay then here it is does it perform uh, with software under test like whatever software you have is it in is it compatible with your software mm -hmm. or does it uh, work within the current infrastructure whatever infrastructure we have is it directly working with that or you need some changes in your extra uh, infrastructure so three questions okay in it okay so yeah. this is what is the proof of concept first of all whether this tool is compatible with your tool or not whether it is uh, current infrastructure whether it is supporting the current infrastructure or not uh, and if you, even if it is supporting then how much changes you need in your infrastructure to introduce this tool in your system so all these okay. things if you evaluate this is a proof of concept okay now comes the pilot project here did they ask you like how we should introduce the tool into an organization yes okay that was the question <laughs> yeah so i was aware that okay this is how they asked the question so uh, i think i have the point yeah so we should roll out across the organization incrementally in a incremental way we should roll out but anyways we will go there 
uh, that should be one of the and uh, one of the option there that how you are doing it okay but i'm not sure let's see learn more details about the tool so during the pilot project we want to what is the pilot project first of all like you have lots of team within your organization so within this team also you may have sub teams in maybe then what you do is once you purchase a tool you give it to the sub team or maybe to a one team very small uh, number of people you give this tool so that they can use it okay so this is a, what is the purpose here so that they learn about the tool what they will learn whether this tool is fit for our process or not what we need to change the proof of concept they will try to evaluate that they will also evaluate what are the standard ways of using this tool they will note it down for our company how we can use this tool and they will also evaluate if we can achieve the benefit at the reasonable cost or not so this is the task of the pilot project why we introduce a tool as a pilot project in our team is this clear anything was there in the exam of these points or not uh, no not obvious then it was related to this one then yeah, how you introduce matters. yes so we have to roll out this tool in an organization in an incremental way so as i was saying so first to this two this team then maybe to two teams and then maybe to the complete organization after that once we get the confidence so incrementally we have to introduce i think i also have this question with me maybe i will just check and i will share with you i think it's the same question which you might have got in exam yeah then adapting and improving processes to fit with tool use so uh, we have already seen a proof of concept so previously you saw that this tool if you introduce these are the changes we need to do then once this tool comes we have to do those changes first okay and other than that providing training and coaching or mentoring for the new users whoever is going to use it newly we will provide training to them mm -hmm. we will we can define the guidelines and uh, implementing a way to gather information from usage so sometime they will have a log file running behind if something crashes then this log file we have to provide it to the vendor then vendor will evaluate something like that okay and throughout that uh, you uh, life cycle of this tool we will monitor that how much we are using it and how much benefit we are getting out of it okay and then providing tool support to the tester team so if test team needs any training or anything then we should provide them and gathering the lesson learned from all the teams so that we can yeah. make improvement to these tools i think they had asked like which is not the success factor for deployment not okay yeah so these are maybe you can go through it and just see that if is it making sense now to you that okay these all are the success factors and if you have doubt we can i will answer it implementing a way to gather information from usage yes at this point you like yeah so what you do is the you you implement it in a way or like uh, we do know the first stage is that we give it to one team that we tell okay. them to use it and yeah. then we give you the information then we use it to second team and then we get the information or sometime what happens is that when we are using the tool no and the background some logs will be there for this tool so okay. if something goes wrong in this tool or even if something nothing goes wrong then also after some time we can have a look into this log and then see that if, I, if this tool was working properly or not yeah okay okay yeah so this is the last topic of this chapter With this the complete ISTQ syllabus topics uh, ends here. Okay.
Yeah, okay. <laughs> so it was a pretty big session. Yes. <laughs> This one we saw, right? Recently in one of my questions also, SS2, S1, S2, S3, SS. Yes, we saw this. Yeah, but if they have the, they have the same diagram, but the question is different. How many tests are required for all valid transitions? Yes, how many tests we need there are still? For all the valid transitions, okay, so one, two, uh, it's six only, right? Like A to B, B to C, C to D. And then from, oh, F2, this is not a valid case, I think. Yes, F1. F1, why it is not a valid? It's a valid only, no? You do something, then you come back yes. to the same one. Oh. Okay. You can do that also. Like, um, for example, in the mobile, I mean, if you press something, you are on the same screen only, you know, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. If you press on some button, then only you go to next stage. But if you press somewhere else, then you are on the same screen. Okay. How many test cases are required for all valid transitions, right? So mm -hmm. you need to go, this is one test case, right? Then this one, this one, second. Three, all valid transitions. Well, it's not three. One is this one straightforward. One is through down, you go, it is covered. One is through this, and this you cover. Or one they want it like this, and this, and this. But all valid only they're telling you. With three, I can cover all. Is it not like SS to S1 is one case, S1 to S2 is other case, and then S2 to S3 is other case? So if we go by that logic, then in that case, we need six test cases. It looks like that only to me now, because you don't have three. Normally, yeah. Actually, if they write now how many minimum test cases are required to cover all valid, then it should be three answer, but now they have not mentioned that. So all valid transition they are telling. So with that, it looks like three only to me. Uh, 11, 11 of which quiz? 11 of quiz five. And then you have to come back. 11 of quiz five, 11 of quiz five. Answer is D6, no? That was six only. Yeah. Okay. I am actually worried about chapter four. <laughs> no, no. I mean, what I've seen is that uh, you just go through this video again, today's video, no, whatever we have covered uh, in chapter number four, and you try to do it by yourself. Anyway, you know, right, I am going to give the answer. So you pause it at that time, try to solve it by yourself. And once you practice that, right, these questions are enough. Okay. Okay. And then I see that a lot of questions you are getting from one place. I have 40 questions, which was asked in the exam itself. Mm -hmm. and 120 questions so you solve this 120 plus 40 questions and uh, i am sure that you will be through the exam you don't need to worry about that okay okay and that lady sonal she replied me so she said that it is uh, 3.5k is the retake fees okay okay good that you want yeah, i'll be taking it next month not this month i'm running short of money okay okay so <laughs> month you are planning right okay next month mid of maybe early early week of may mm -hmm. yeah at okay. least i'll have some time to revise by then 
Right, yeah. When you are writing this time, just go with full proof thing. You will fourth number chapter. Whatever I have told you, you go through it properly, and I will give you, as I said, one twenty questions. Now after some time, I will give, and uh, also some forty questions. I will give forty questions is like what screenshot I gave you, no? Yeah. It's like that only. So from there also, you can accept accept some questions from uh, that part. Okay. Now, if you see here the third question, consider the following statement. I see X is the right answer. Okay, uh, and multiple condition testing is another name for uh, decision testing. They would also confuse us something like this, no? Which is true and which is false. Mm. So uh, only I think A is the right answer for this because uh, X is hundred percent de uh, decision coverage guarantees hundred percent uh, statement coverage. Mm. Remaining all, it doesn't make sense. Yes. So Y is false. Others are true. They are telling. Okay. So in that we normally see that the V is not the true one. So this option yeah. is for us. And then uh, now we have Y here. So see, they are telling X and Y both are true. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now if you read Y, obviously this is wrong. You know. Wrong. Yes. Obviously both are gone. All three are gone now. You mm -hmm. only have to read A. So sometimes we should we can start from here and then mark the answer and then we should start from here also just to eliminate okay. the thing. Okay, fine. So even though it is confusing here, no, that's what I was saying. So such type of questions is it, it is very easy to get the right answer because you can you have an opportunity to eliminate things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you try these things. Uh, if you are not able to solve, then we can have another one session where you can mark your all the questions and then we can go through them. I think to, for today it is uh, too much done. And uh, you're uh, or you <laughs> want to solve the questions? Uh, no, no, no. What we will do is so I will go through all the topics and this whole week I'm going to prepare and coming weekend maybe like if you are available we can have uh, the quiz questions. By then, even I'll be more confident on answering them. Okay, that that's the best way of doing it, and uh, it's we should not waste our quizzes because they are also limited here. So yeah, yeah you go through the complete syllabus, and then uh, that's the good approach. And uh, yes, okay, fine. Then I will give you one twenty questions, and I will the forty questions I will give you at the end only when you say that you are completely prepared for the exam, right? Yeah. Then I give you those 40 questions. That 40 questions is like you're getting it in the ISTQB exam itself. That's how the people mm -hmm. got. So that is that will be your one round of preparation before the exam itself. Okay. okay. Once, okay. once you say that you are confident and you want to go for the exam, before booking the exam, I will give you these 40 questions. Then you mark it like one, in one hour, you have to mark it. And then let's see. Fine. That would be a very good exercise, I would say. And I will. I have the answers for all of these things. I have already solved it. And uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So Saturday next week Saturday we'll catch up then. Yes, we can catch it up uh, next week Saturday. Uh, I am going to get a software by Tuesday actually. Let's see what is the status of that. But I think one hour or two hours should be fine. Okay. Okay. Even if not, yeah. then I will make a. I will take a time. Then uh, let's see. Okay. I mean, I will make sure that you have your doubts are clarified. Okay. I told you right in the starting, my objective is that you clear the exam this time more than you. So yeah, that's how it's my approach because the, till now, whomever I have uh, given this training, I have not seen anyone getting failed. And I just want to keep that record also for myself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fine then. And thanks. It was quite interactive. Even I was like, uh, it was a little bit too much for me. I think one chapter we could have shifted for next time. So I will not cover in two days. I will cover it in three days only. Two, two per day. That is, I think, best approach. Yeah. Okay. Okay, then, Kiran. Then uh, the and I think also this uh, recordings, like, is it possible for me to download from YouTube? I'm not sure. Is it possible for you to download? Because I was looking for an option. I thought probably you have disabled it. But I don't see the download option in the web page. Is it? Uh, uh, I'm also and you also told.